Good evening, I am Trinice Riggs, the chair of the school board of the city of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. on this 28th day of March, 2023. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex School Board Room is Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, Ms. Martin, Ms. Melnick, and Ms. Owens. Thank you. Now we are going to have um, the moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in observing a moment of silence. Please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, now we're to the the best part of tonight's meeting, what we enjoy so much up here, are our student, employee, and public awards recognition. Ms. Martin? So our first recognition this evening is the winner of the Virginia Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association's Outstanding Service Award. Please welcome Lisa Corpru. The Virginia Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association has selected Lisa Corpru as a recipient of the 2023 Outstanding Service Award. Ms. Corpru was selected at the annual meeting of the past President's Council. The Outstanding Service Award is given to individuals who have made significant contributions to the profession of athletic administration. Ms. Corpru has worked at Bayside High School since 1995 and along with her service to Virginia Beach City Public Schools has served on athletic administration boards at the state and national level. Congratulations, Ms. Corpru. We are so proud of you. Our next recognition this evening is the recipient of the Friend of Nafis Award. Please welcome Francis Thomas. As an, as an active member of the National Association of Federally Impacted Schools and the Military Impacted Schools Association, budget analysis, analyst, I'm sorry, uh, Fran Thomas works to ensure that Congress continues his obligation to support federally connected school districts with impact aid funding. She was recently awarded the Friend of Nafis Award in DC for a longstanding support of the impact aid program and its benefits to our students. She is our primary contact between VBCPS and the U.S. Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Defense Education Activity, and members of the House and Senate Impact Aid Coalitions for matters concerning impact aid funding. Throughout her 32 years, with VPCPS. For several years, Mrs. Thomas has also coordinated and implemented the state triennial census for Virginia Beach. She maintains regular and frequent contact with legislative liaisons in both the House and Senate and has shared the message of the importance of the impact aid program to members of the Military Economic Development Committee serving the Hampton Roads area. She maintains relationships with local base officials and military school liaison officers in the Hampton Roads area. Mrs. Thomas coordinates training events and promotes discussions within the impact aid community, federally impacted school divisions throughout the nation, and with local stakeholders for public education. Congratulations. Congratulations, Mrs. Thomas. We are very proud of you. Our next recognition is for the Virginia High School League Class 6 Boys Swimming 500-Yard Freestyle State Champion. Please welcome Robert D'Annunzio. <laughs> Bobby is a senior and standout swimmer for Ocean Lakes High School. He plans to attend the University of Florida. In 2021, Bobby won first place for VHSL Class 6 200-yard individual medley and the VHSL Class 6 500-yard freestyle. This year, he is the state champion for the 500-yard freestyle. Congratulations, Bobby. We are so proud of you. 
Our final recognition this evening is for the Lady Cavaliers of Princess Anne High School. Will our 2023 state champions and their coaches please come forward? The Lady Cavaliers of Princess Anne defeated the Skyhawks of L.C. Bird High School to capture the Class 5 VHSL Girls Basketball State Championship. This is Princess Anne's 13th state title in 16 state appearances. Wow. The team members are Winta Brumage, Abby Sabatino, Maura Graves, Tanasia Spencer, Giselle James, Zakia Stevenson, Alana Olds, J Josiah Olds, Amaya Olds, Amani Olds, Anasia Olds, Damari Mori, Haley Harris, Celeste Bailey, Zoe Collins, and Janina Smith. Congratulations to Coach Darnell Dozier and assistant coaches William Alston, Randy Stafford, Purvis Stevenson, and Mark Velbus for this amazing achievement. We are proud of you all. Madam Chair, this concludes our, the school board recognitions for this evening. We are now at the adoption of the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda as presented besides mine? Okay. Um, I was gonna add that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, we're gonna add to our agenda item 15C, appointment to the ad hoc workforce committee. So make a I, motion to a call for, for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. As with, amended. With the uh, uh, modification. Ms. Anderson. And second? Second. Ms. Brown. Is there any more discussion? Hearing none, I call for a vote to approve the agenda as presented with the modification. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now with our superintendent's report, Dr. Spence, we look forward to your report today. Thank you, and good evening, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board. Here's just a few items of interest for you and our families to know this evening. First, tomorrow night, you are invited to help us celebrate 50 years of excellence at the Virginia Beach Technical and Career Education Center. It's going to be an open house tomorrow night from 6 to 8 p.m. where guests will be able to walk the halls visit classrooms, catch up with old friends and colleagues, and meet current staff and students. Nearly 40,000 11th and 12th grade students have taken advantage of career training opportunities since the school opened in 1972. At least eight current instructors are former Tech Center students who launched successful careers and decided to return and teach the next generation. About 700 students currently participate in 23 credentialed program, uh, programs, including the top licensed practical nursing program in the state. Congratulations to the Tech Center for tapping into generations of talent in Virginia Beach and helping our students truly be future ready. On this next slide, Lynn Haven Elementary is helping students be future ready before they even enter kindergarten. Pre-K teacher Barbara Griffin organized career activities for three of her classes and students spent a month learning about community helpers like doctors, police, teachers, and members of the military. 
To end the unit, Ms. Griffin asked her neighbor, who's a firefighter, and several parents to come in and speak with students about how they keep their community safe. While connecting classroom activities to the real world, students were able to enjoy seeing everyone in their uniforms and talking about the roles they play. And speaking of our littlest learners, we are spreading the news that kindergarten registration begins on April the 6th. Starting next Wednesday, parents should go to vbschools.com to complete that paperwork. Their child's school will then call them to set up an appointment to register their rising kindergartner, and appointments will begin on April 25th. Also starting April 25th, parents may visit their school's website on vbschools.com and watch an orientation video. And of course, as always, <clears throat> parents and kindergartners will have in-person orientation at their schools in August. I do see it says begins April 5th up there, and it says April 6th on here. We're going to go with April 5th. Um, <laughs> uh, we do look forward to having that next generation of students join us. Next, kudos to all of the schools who participated in the Operation Smile Shamrock Final Mile on March 18th. This was the culmination of an ongoing running and walking program for elementary students to promote lifelong fitness. Students ran at school and at home in the weeks preceding the marathon to accumulate 25.2 total miles, and then they ran the final mile of their marathon on race day. Doing so, our students raised money for Operation Smile, making it possible for children just like themselves to receive new smiles and to live happier and healthier lives. Operation Smile recognized Allenton Elementary third grader Farron Cayley as a VIP runner. Farron, who's pictured here on the left with Allenton's physical education staff, has had cleft surgery and encourages her schoolmates to support Operation Smile. Allenton's been in the top three schools for participation in this event in, in this event for the past 15 years, and this year they had 288 runners. Creed's Elementary had the highest participation rating this year with 71% of their students running for this event. So thanks to all of our students, family, and staff for supporting this worthy cause. And then finally, I just wanted to share these photos from our month-long celebration of reading. Our students and staff celebrated National Reading Month with engaging and fun activities. As always, Reading Month activities went beyond literacy. For example, Woodstock Elementary second graders read the book Rosie Revere, Engineer, and then designed their own helicopter prototypes. All of our fifth grade, all of our fifth grade students are reading L. Ray Jakes is Magic this month for all district reads. The program put a free copy of the books into the hands of students and encouraged them to read aloud with their families. Newcastle Elementary was one of several schools that hosted magic shows to help motivate our young readers, and there were also Dress Like a Magician days throughout the district. We were happy to see local news media coverage of this campaign, and we look forward to expanding the All District Reads program next year, and as a reminder, board members, you received a copy of that book for your own reading enjoyment this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. This concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Uh, 10, approval of our meeting minutes. There are two sets of minutes to approve this evening. First, for the March 7th, 2023 special school board meeting. Are there any modifications to the March 7th, 2023 special school board meeting minutes as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the March 7th, 2023 minutes as presented. Mr. Callan, do I have a second? Ms. Martin, any discussion? Hearing none, I call for a vote to approve the March 7th, 2023 minutes as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. B, March 14th, 2023, regular school board minute, meeting. Are there any modifications to the March 14th, 2023, regular school board meeting minutes as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the March 14th, 2023 minutes as presented. Do I have a motion? Ms. Manning, do I have a second? Ms. Franklin, any discussion? Hearing none, I call for a vote to approve the March 14th, 2023 minutes as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. And now we're on 11, the pub public comments, until 8 p.m. The school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant to pre-K 
K through 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. Speakers are responsible for being in the school board room auditorium or online when they are called to speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak or is not online or unable to unmute when called to speak, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of this public comment se session. The school board also invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. Madam Clerk, please introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first student speakers are Emily Labar, Alana Spencer, and Natalie Gonzalez. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Labar, and I'm the president of First Colonial High School's Gender Sexuality Alliance. Why am I still here? I'm sure that's a question you're also wondering. It seems to me that if anything we said was going to sway you, it would have at some point over the past six months. The model policies were made to target transgender students, to belittle them, to disrespect them. Hatred is a disease. It's the poison you drink hoping somebody else will die. I'm not saying that this board is hateful, but I am saying that inaction in the face of injustice is just as harmful. Why am I still here? We're burned out, tired, busy, and really want to go home. This is not how I envisioned spending my senior year, begging for equitable treatment twice a month, especially from a school system that, in my eyes, has always protected me. No matter how much I want to give up or to go home, I know that I can't. I'm not here for me. I'm here for every other student in this division because I know that we deserve better than this. I feel a responsibility towards them, just as you do. I get hateful messages because I come speak here. Snide comments, disrespect, if that's what they say to my face, I can't imagine what's said behind my back. I can take it because I know what I'm doing is right. But that doesn't mean I should have to. We shouldn't have to be here six months later fighting against the same discriminatory policies. Hatred is a disease. It infects and it festers and it has no place in Virginia Beach. I have decided to stick to love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alana Spencer, Natalie Gonzalez, and Alexa Hernandez. Welcome. Good evening, board members. I'm speaking against the 2022 model guidelines alongside my friends once again. And I don't know what to say, truly. I've made my way to every school board meeting I could since September of last year. And between here and now with dozens of different speakers and plenty of the same speakers, we've said most of what needs to be said. So I looked back upon my first school board speech and I asked why. Simply, why? Why was I here when I had other things to do between schoolwork and getting myself ready for the next day? The school board meeting wasn't something I particularly wanted to do on my Tuesday afternoon. But a while ago, I found my purpose here and I no longer ask myself why I'm here. I accepted it. I'll be here every other Tuesday until what's right is done. And as long as I have a voice, I will speak for what's right, what I believe in, and what's necessary. I will speak for the queer community. I will speak for VBCPS. I will take some extra days of stress or some sleepless nights because I have the privilege to speak up here on this podium. That's one of the things that's so unfair about this is that the people that these guidelines affect can't speak for themselves out of fear. We will be here. I will be here. No problem. My problem that our is that our voices seem to be landing upon deaf ears, blind eyes, and silent mouths. No matter what strategy we portray, whether it's more factual, legal, or more emotional, we see no action and I ask why. Why aren't you saying anything? Why aren't you moving? Don't you understand that there are lives at risk? That each day these policies wave in the air, another trans youth lives hangs in the balance. Why do you stay complacent to policies that will bring upon so much destruction, so much hate, so much death? 
I know you understand. We've been teaching you how to understand for six months now, a half a year. The longer the radio science continues, the more I see ignorance spread. The more I see the belittlement, the harassment, and the bullying of trans youth. In my own school hallways, I'm so tired. I'm tired of the stigma of the quote unquote controversiality of a kid proud to be themselves. And it scares me as I see more of these hate-filled ideals coming closer and closer towards our home. Eden Knight, a trans woman who went to George Mason only a few weeks ago committed suicide because her home wasn't safe. She was taken out of her home, forced to detransition, didn't name the misgendered. And all of this happened right next door. So for my final questions, how close will you let discrimination, ignorance, and hate come? How close? How long will you wait? How many lives will be lost? Will you wait until a tragedy occurs in our school district seconds. to tell us that you deny the 2022 policies? Thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Gonzalez, Alexa Hernandez, and then Elizabeth Anuski. Welcome. Good evening. Over the past six months, we have had over 50 individual students speak out against Governor Yunkin's 2022 model policy, and we only hope to grow that number more and more as time goes on. However, despite having such a substantial number of speakers, there are concerns that our group does not effectively represent all Virginia Beach City Public Schools students, and they'd be right. I wish I could say that we represented every student. I wish I could say that we represented every student not because I want everyone to think like me or to hold the same opinions on trans people as I do, but because I want every student in Virginia Beach City Public Schools to value kindness and respect. It's heartbreaking to say, but the reality is that despite progress, many trans students continue to endure discrimination, hatred, and harassment on a daily basis. I can't tell you how many times I've witnessed one of my trans classmates getting ridiculed behind their back for dressing the wrong way or for having a weird name. Just a few days ago, as I entered the classroom, I overheard a classmate mocking a girl who had rejected him because he did not accept trans people. He called her a heifer for it. School is often considered a safe place for trans students, often the only safe place for trans students, but that doesn't mean that prejudice and hostility are not still present in our district. When I ask my friends and classmates to attend these meetings, it's always clear that they passionately stand against this policy and don't want to see it implemented, and yet it feels like they think of it as something inevitable. There's this looming sense of resignation that I get from my peers, especially from my trans peers, a sense of, well, it's to be expected. And as sad as this attitude makes me, can we blame them for feeling that way? This policy comes as no surprise for many trans students because mistreatment is something they've gotten used to and accepted as something they can't fight against. Resignation is defined as the acceptance of something undesirable but inevitable. This policy may be undesirable, but it isn't inevitable. It doesn't have to be. Maybe rejecting it won't magically end transphobia and bullying, and maybe it won't fix the broken homes so many trans students come from, but we cannot become resigned to the idea that a safe place for trans students is something unattainable. Rejecting this policy will challenge the idea that animosity and fear is inevitable for trans students and will bring us one step closer to making our schools into the welcoming and accepting environments we all seconds. know they can be. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexa Hernandez, Elizabeth Newski, Icarus Landacker. Welcome. Hi, I'm Icarus Landacker. Alexa and Elizabeth are not here. Worthiness. It's a word we have put on a pedestal, and for good reason. We all have limited time and energy, so we go on through the day putting things in order of importance. We rank people, places, and things. We place worth on them. Worthiness is defined as the quality of deserving time and respect. Something is worthy when time, resources, and effort is put into it. As you can probably tell, worthiness has been on my mind a lot as of late. Part of that may come from the fact I have been called worthless for a large part of my life, whether it was by others or myself, but I think the main reason for this word echoing in my mind is that it's at the center of the topic we come here to discuss meeting after meeting after meeting. 
It is the reason we come back, because we believe that these meetings are worth our time, because transgender students are worthy. I am worthy. That is not a sentence I've been able to say before, because it is not one I believed for a long time. Transgender students, like myself, have had our worth stripped away throughout the day as others misgender or deadname us. However, most of the time, it's not others who are the biggest harm. It's ourselves. People have placed a belief around gender identity that when someone transitions, it happens in an instant. One minute I was a girl, the next I was non-binary. This is not true. It is a process. Transgender students take months or even years to figure out their identity. We ask ourselves again and again, who am I? And it takes a long time before we get an answer outside of, I don't know. For me, it took three months of wrestling with my doubt, denial, and thoughts before I even considered the possibility of being non-binary. And that was, the, that was only the beginning. To this day, I still find myself misgendering myself, and every time I do, it hurts more than I could possibly describe to you. To this day, I return home from school to look into the mirror to ask, am I worthy of their respect, their attention? Am I worthy of their respect even if they refuse to give it to me whenever they choose to utter the syllables of my dead name? The answer is yes. Yes, 30 I am seconds. worthy of simple respect because I am a human. I don't know who I am. Some people go their whole life without knowing that, but I know for a fact I am worth it, and so is every transgender student in this school system. This policy treats us less than human because it takes away our name and our titles. You joined the school board because despite the long hours and challenges you would face, you believed it to be worth it. You joined it because you deemed us, your students, to be worth it. And that is time. Our next speaker is Charlie Bodenstein then Eden Amato, then Bradley Fish. Welcome. Hello, my name is Charlie Bodenstein and I go to First Colonial High School. And I am reading a letter from another student. I have so many amazing friends and about 90% of them are gay, trans, or just part of the LGBTQ community. I met most of them in theater and performing arts and being around so many people like that helped me become more comfortable and confident in my gender identity and sexuality. Sharing experiences and relating to each other just feels good. It is nice to be able to ask the questions that I feel like I can't ask anyone else. While I do get inappropriate comments and occasionally get called slurs from people who don't agree with my lifestyle, the teachers, when they notice, do a decent job of stopping them. Besides my friends and other people I know, I don't feel like other students try and understand me, or anyone else for that matter. While I may identify as the gender I was born as, I still use a different name and pronouns. My name, Z, makes me feel comfortable. It feels good whenever I hear someone call me Z. It makes me feel safe and welcome. Dead naming and misgendering poses a genuine threat to the mental health of trans students. Even though I am fine being called Bella, it still gives me a short feeling of shock and disappointment whenever I hear it. Just imagine a trans student being called something they are not okay with. It hurts, and it makes you feel unsafe. Whether you dead name or misgender someone, it truly harms people, and outing is even worse. When someone at school, when someone is outed, there's a sense of betrayal and fear. That student might have only felt safe enough at school, and outing them removes that sense of security. If their parents are against their identity, they could be kicked out, disowned, and unfortunately, even physically abused or killed. It is not safe to be outed. It poses a serious threat to the mental and physical health of a child. These policies are just showing that schools genuinely do not care for the health or safety of their students, that they don't care if students are bullied, depressed, suicidal, abused, without a home, etc. Most of the time when I tell students I go by Z or zero, they laugh and dismiss me. Like it doesn't matter what I think. Zero is a stupid name for a little girl. 30 seconds. My name is extremely important to me. It was a nickname given to me by my closest friends 
and it just stuck. Using my name makes me feel safe, accepted, welcome, and understood. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eden Amato, Bradley Fish, and then Charlie Levine. Welcome. Hello, my name is Eden Amato, and I'm a freshman at Lansdowne High School. For the past several months, my peers have been speaking at these meetings. You've heard our outcries and our different points of view, and I want to bring another one up, the point of view of Virginia Beach City Public School teachers. I know of many teachers who don't believe in these policies, but if they spoke out, they could lose their jobs. Because of that, I want to present their point of view to you to the best of my abilities. Teachers in our school system want nothing more than for students to have a safe space to express themselves without judgment or prejudice. Teachers already have difficult jobs and barely make livable wages, so I highly doubt that they want to make their li the lives of their students miserable. I know of many teachers whose conscience wouldn't be able to handle these policies. For example, one time I was in class and my friend was called a transgender slur and our teachers basically pulled the kid aside and said, hey, that's not okay. And I know that my teachers are highly supportive of my transgender classmates or anyone who chooses to go by different names or pronouns. Many of my teachers are supportive of trans and non-binary students, and I doubt that they want to think of students going by their preferred names and or pronouns as a bad thing. However, I know a lot of teachers aren't like that. I believe if we really want our schools to be safe places, teachers could learn ways to support transgender and non-binary students who decide to go by different names instead of adding them to their families or parents. Student safety is extremely important to the well-being of Virginia schools, and passing these policies can not only make our school system look bad, but it makes them closeted places for students. All a student wants is to feel safe and feel like they can be who they are in a school setting, because they can't always do that at home, and I believe that passing these policies could absolutely damage the mental health of said students. I hope this opened your eyes and helped you look at these policies from a different lens. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Bradley Fish, then Charlie Levine, then Elijah Gum. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. What kind of world would this be if everyone here simply pretended that transgender individuals did not exist, a world where we leave them in the dust? It would not be a world where they do not exist. It would just be a world where they knew they weren't welcome, an unaccepting place that promotes fear and depression, self-harm and suicide. This world I'm speaking of is still very much real even today. We can see this right here in this room each time a speaker represents the pro-model po policy position. We gain a glimpse into the potential threat of regression with arguments that boil down to the good old days. But there wasn't anything good about them, where transgender people would be mistreated or taught to hide, where women would be subservient to abusive husbands, where some husbands would just be weighed down by a constant societal pressure to be sole providers. The veil of nostalgia is a tricky thing, but just because you did not see it in the past doesn't mean it wasn't present. You may not be able to believe it, but in the past 50 years, we have seen such great leaps towards a more equitable future that has benefited most groups, and we still aren't done. We will not be done until everyone has a fair shot in life, and this is all brings us to the present, right here in this auditorium. I find it ironic, actually. The theater of a school is a place of such self-discovery and casting aside the expectations of others to find your own path. I need not have to explain the disproportionate number of queer identifying people in theater. It only makes sense that when people don't fit the mold built by rigid societies, they instead find their own spaces. So how about we protect and grow these safe spaces for them, to let them know that they can identify themselves in whatever manner brings them happiness and confidence. We can decide this for all the transgender students of Virginia Beach right here in this very room. We can decide to look for the future and marvel at the discoveries made by each precious life, avoiding the loss that may otherwise fall from suicides. We can help make this happen with something as simple as a stroke of a pen. To avoid regression towards a darker time could not be made easier, and me and my friends who sit behind me continue to highlight this fact. From statistics to anecdotes to heart wrenchers and stalwart opposition, we are all united in this goal, and if we are to fail and the pen falls on the wrong side of history, then we will rally our forces again and again until progress has been made in the proper direction. You have already seen our dedications, and it must be understood that more students from all of the schools under your wing will come out in droves to protect themselves and their friends if the mall policy comes to pass. 30 seconds. 
We will rest only to sharpen our wits and try once more to refute the policy that endangers the, st the students of Virginia Beach. That is our duty. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Levine, Elijah Gum, and then A.J. Quatero. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here tonight to oppose the 2022 model policies regarding the treatment of transgender and non-binary students. Tonight, I want to reiterate some case law in an effort to persuade you all not to implement these policies, specifically Tinker v. Des Moines. Mary Beth Tinker was a high school student opposed to the Vietnam War. She, among others, wore a black armband with an embroidered peace sign to protest the war. Tinker's principal suspended her indefinitely for her protest. Furious with the censorship, she filed Tinker v. Des Moines, a case claiming her First Amendment rights were violated. Simply put, this case is the legal bedrock of all students' rights discussions. In this case, the Supreme Court famously ruled that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. To directly quote the Tinker case brief, the school district's actions evidently stemmed from a fear of possible disruption rather than any actual interference. The one and only reason that schools can suppress students' First Amendment rights is when the speech or expression materially and substantially interferes with learning. We aren't asking for anything radical, just for every student to be treated with dignity, because that can make all the difference for transgender and non-binary students. Changing a few syllables in a student's name is not a material or substantial interference. The idea that such a simple change harms the classroom is one based on fear rather than reality. These fears mirror the fear of black wristbands and tinker, the same fears that the Supreme Court ruled insufficient to suppress speech. Legal precedent supports and protects transgender students' rights to self-expression. Mary Beth Tinker fought so that students could express themselves within their school. These students thrive because of the rights to expression that this case granted them. Something I've been thinking a lot about recently is how exhausting it is to live in fear. There are a lot of things that scare me, most notably the future. When I go to school, there's always a low-lying fear that I will be the next victim of senseless gun violence in American schools. And maybe this future I'm working so hard toward will become non-existent. I can't even imagine how overwhelmingly terrifying it is for transgender students to merely exist in our society. These students have so much to fear, whether it be abuse, violence, or mental health struggles. Taking this into, into perspective, how can we in good conscience allow one more thing one more thing for these students to fear. 30 seconds. How can we allow this policy to become one that teachers have to follow? Please call students by their names and respect their privacy. That is all we are asking. We students are the ones who live in the realities created by hateful policies like the 2022 model guidelines. So please consider our request not to implement these policies. I urge the board to enforce policies that encourage love and respect rather than hate. Thank you for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Elijah Gum, then A.J. Quartero, then Bethany Wilmoth. Welcome. Good evening, board. My name is Elijah Gum. I'm a senior at First Colonial High School. Oh, and thank you for letting me speak. Put students first, seek growth, be open to change, do great work together, value differences. These are the promises that, that the Virginia Beach City, City Public School System makes to its community. All we are asking is for you to stick to them. As representatives of the school district, you cannot claim to put students first, yet require parents' permission to call a student by their correct name and pro pronouns. That's not putting students first. It's prioritizing the parents at the expense of their children. The Trevor Project found that less than one-third of transgender youth they surveyed had said that their homes were, gen were gender affirming. If children cannot be affirmed at home, the very least you can do is affirm them at school. It could very well be what saves their lives. Don't endanger children because you want to satisfy their parents. That is not putting students first. Is it really seeking growth and being open to change if students are not able to express themselves without interference? Every cisgender student in this school system is able to express their gender identity as they feel it is. 
Every cisgender student gets to be called the name they identify with. Every cisgender student gets, gets to be identified by the pronouns they believe best fit them. Not a single cisgender student in, in this district is required to have the parent permission to, to be called the pronouns and name that best correspond with their gender identity. Being called the proper name and pronouns is not a privilege that should only be reserved to cisgender students. It prioritizes one demographic while intentionally making it harder for another to succeed. It's clear that these policies were not made with students in mind because they wouldn't exist if they had. This is not great work. You are in control of the education of 65,000 children who need emotional support now more than they ever will. And you truly believe that teaching them hate or that they cannot be who they are is constructive? Calling this great work makes a mockery of our education system. These policies demonstrate just how little differences are valued. Transgender students deserve to be identified in alignment with their gender identities. The fact of the matter is, the new policies are deadly. If you enact these policies, you are condemning these children to bullying at best, death at worst. Thank you. Our next speaker is A.J. Quatero, then Bethany Wilmoth, then Geneva Warren. Welcome. Good evening, my name is AJ Corderero. My pronouns are they, them, and I am a sophomore at Kelm High School. For a moment, I would like you to step into my shoes. Envision waking up early every morning in a crisis. Every morning when I wake up, I am confronted by an acute awareness that people don't see me for who I am. I feel sick and I prepare myself for an onslaught of words that don't define me as I walk into school in constant battle with myself. She, her, girl, miss, words that inspire heart palpitating anxiety within me because they do not match up with who I am. The worst part is that sometimes I cannot correct them. I know that while some simply won't listen to me if I tell them who I am, others can harm me for it. Say nothing or risk it all, it's a question that I ask myself constantly. My anxiety ridden days are difficult to get through, but I don't get through them without help. Friends, teachers, counselors, people who see me for who I am, People who I am not afraid to be myself around. To them, I am not just a hurtful word to be shouted. I am a person. I am AJ. Enter the 2022 model policies. These policies will make those days that I just described to you much, much worse. Those days that were already so hard to get through. Days that are commonplace for any transgender student. Peers will stop thinking that it is okay to choose boxes to fit us into, and they will start knowing that it is okay. Misgendering and dead naming will become normal, no longer disrespectful, but customary. All of the trans students who don't have a supportive home to go to will be robbed of the only environment that contains any semblance of acceptance for them. Harassment will run rampant among peers, and teachers will be forced to make us feel unwelcome in the classroom. These policies will do nothing but isolate us from our peers, convincing us that we don't belong, that we would be better off non-existent or worse, dead, rather than accepted in school. A transgender student will be redefined by the VDOE as a public school student whose parents had requested in writing due to their child's persistent and sincere belief that his or her gender differs with his or her sex, that their child be so identified while at school. A definition that has been decided for us for the sake of bias. Bias which should not be deemed more important than the lives and well-being of transgender students. We are a part of your schools and we will not be silenced by these policies. We deserve to express ourselves to whomever we see fit. We are just as important as any seconds. other students, and we deserve the same safety and respect. Our days should get better, not worse. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bethany Wilmoth, then Geneva Warren, then Naomi Giamdu. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Bethany Wilmoth, and I'm a freshman at Salem High School, and I'm here to talk against the proposed 2022 model policies. She is a 23-year-old extroverted young woman. Regarded as intelligent by her friends, she seemed to have interests relying on economics, politics, computer science, anime, and music. Her name is Eden Knight. She is a transgender woman, and she is dead. 
Eden Knight was born in 2000 in Saudi Arabia. She soon moved to the United States in order to attend George Mason University and study computer science. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Eden Knight came out as transgender. She began to engage more with transgender issues online and advocated for better treatment of transgender people. She hoped to become an advocate for trans people in Saudi Arabia, a country that criminalizes the gender expression of transgender people. She began hormone therapy in 2022. She lived with a close friend. Her close friend's child viewed Eden as an aunt. On March 12, 2023, Eden Knight posted a long note to her Twitter feed explaining her situation and that she would no longer continue fighting. She goes on to say that in August 2022, Eden was approached by fixers. Their names are Michael Pokalko and Ellen Cole. These two claimed that they would help fix her now strained relationship with her family and would be able to assist with her immigration status, but that was a lie. In October 2022, Pokalko and Cole brought Eden to Washington DC where they introduced her to a Saudi attorney by the name of Bader who brought her to a hotel. As time regressed, Bader became insistent with the idea of getting Eden to detransition. Bader intimidated Eden, who complied in fear that her undocumented immigration status would be used as blackmail. She was forced to dress masculinely and was soon flown back to Saudi Arabia in December to live with her family. Her belongings were confiscated to prevent her from leaving. She had attempted to continue her hormone replacement therapy, but to no her avail, as her parents were consistently monitoring her room and confiscating any sort of gender affirming items. Her parents eventually admitted to hiring the fixers and Bader to retrieve her from the United States. A lack of gender affirmation and the sense of betrayal from her family led up to her note, which she left on Twitter rather than in her own home. Her family soon posted seconds. about Eden in order to confirm her death, repeatedly misgendering and dead naming her. The family quickly went silent when the replies were flooded with Twitter users correcting them on the pronouns and name they used. This is what happens when one is repeatedly dead named, outed, misgendered, and denied gender affirmation. We've seen this happen repeatedly. How many more people have to die before action is taken? How many more people have to die before the state chooses to consider the feelings or mindset of transgender individuals? And that is time. Our next speaker is Geneva Warren, then Naomi Jamu, and Jay Cook. Good evening, members of the school board. <clears throat> My name is Geneva Warren, Welcome. and I am a sophomore at First Colonial High School. A name, a pronoun, a title, a label, a simple set of syllables that acts as an honorific of another human being. That is what the fight is for. That's what we are making all this fuss about. But it's so much more than this. A name is the first thing a person labels you as from the moment you start interacting with them. A name is what defines everything that people connect to you. Your likes, your interests, your friends. It's your identity. It is you. That's what we fight for. Me and my peers could stand up here all day and dish out statistic after statistic, but it won't be enough if you don't listen and truly comprehend what we are trying to not change, but what we are trying to maintain. In this current point in time, hundreds of children are trans and here you sit, unaffected by any of them. So why? Why affirm Glenn Youngkin's selfish, discriminatory, and unjust laws? Laws based off everything America has stood and fought against. Why instate your biased, borderline cowardice laws while having the audacity to sit here and say you stand for the children? For the past six plus months, the children have been begging you to stand for them. Are you willing to turn your back on them, betray their trust just because you can't accept that someone is different from you? We are asking for you to change your name. We aren't asking for you to be buddy-buddy with transgender individuals. We aren't even asking you to like transgender children. We are merely asking you to continue giving them the rights that they were born with, the same ones that every child, adult, and in between deserves. Don't let your selfishness get in the way of progress and in the way of a child's happiness and well being. Our next speaker is Naomi Giamu, then Jay Cook, then Addison McGinty. <clears throat> Welcome. Good evening, my name is Naomi Kadamu and I'm a senior at Lansetown High School. 
Over the past school year, me and my fellow students have been writing speeches, letters, and coming before the board to speak in defense of transgender students. Students, parents, and teachers keep coming because we know that transgender students do not deserve anything less than equality. These proposed policies come these proposed policies we come to protest are founded on ignorant views on what protecting children means. They would strip away the respect that teachers and students alike we are, willingly, are willing to give transgender students. If you want to protect students, treat them equally and fairly, treat them with respect, and treat them how they've asked time and time over again over these past few months at board meetings. In the classroom, trans students are treated with equality. To take away their community at school would only do harm and benefit no one. The existence of trans students does not disrupt class, does not make their classmates uncomfortable, and it does not deserve to be hidden. To say otherwise and to force teachers to out their students will not make the school system a happier, equal place. It would only succeed in accomplishing the opposite, making students feel unsafe in the, in the learning environment. It would teach them that school isn't a place of equality or fairness or community. It would teach them that acceptance is not a core value of VBCPS. Protecting children means respecting them and accepting them. Protecting children means understanding them and loving them, even if they don't adhere to, trans, to traditional gender norms. Protecting children means treating each and every one of them with equal respect and giving each th the same opportunity to have a community and to grow in an environment where they can have friends and feel safe. To only provide that community and acceptance to cisgender students is not equality. As I and many others have testified, we are happy to respect our trans classmates. We are happy to treat them equally and fairly. We come to these school board meetings in opposition of the proposed policies because every student should be given an equal opportunity in the school, so school system. By outing, trans and 30 seconds. by outing trans kids and forcing them into the closet, you teach them they are separate from their school's community and interfere with their ability to connect and learn from the school system. You first, you've heard first-hand experiences from students and teachers. When transgender students are treated equally and with respect, they are happier, and contribute more to class, and are able to connect with their classmates. This is why we continue to come and ask that. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jay Cook, then Addison McGinty, and then Finn Sproul. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Jay Cook, and I'm a transgender high school student in Virginia Beach. The opposition cries for parental rights like it is land and they are drowning, like it is life or death, parental rights or death. To that, I say this is life or death, trans life or death, trans rights or death. Figuratively, on my part, I feel the need to clarify that. But for many others, it is not a figurative matter. For decades upon decades, we have watched transgender and LGBTQ youth take their own lives. To them, it was not figurative. There have been many of us who have stood here and given you names. Names of transgender youth and young adults who have been killed or who have killed themselves as a result of the hatred we direct, direct at anyone or anything that does not fit into our boxes. One thing that really stood out to me when I researched some of these individuals were dates, and I'd like to share my findings with you now. December 28, 2014. A trans girl by the name of Leela Alcorn, who was invalidated, misgendered, and ostracized by her family, took her own life. March 23, 2015, North Carolina's first transgender homecoming king and trans rights activist Blake Brockington took his own life. April 11, 2022, transgender teen Phyllis Joy, after being cyberbullied, misgendered, and mistreated by her peers, took her own life. March 12, 2023, Arabian American transgender woman Eden Knight, who aspired to provide a safe and accepting world to all transgender youth, took her own life. Eight years, eight years between the deaths of Leela and Eden, eight years excluding the hundreds of thousands of transgender people who have fallen victim to suicide before Leela. Eight years and counting. How long will it take for us to realize that this is not just going to stop? We need to protect our youth. We need to protect our trans youth. 
We know civil rights is a patient battle, so we will keep coming. We fight for ourselves, for our friends, and our peers. We fight for Leela, for Blake, for Phyllis, for Eden, and every other transgender individual who has had to feel the pain brought on by disrespect, invalidation, and unacceptance. On December 28, 2014, Leela Alcorn wrote, quote, the only way I will rest in peace is if one day transgender people aren't treated the way I was. They're treated like humans, with valid feelings and human rights. My death needs to mean something." End quote. 30 seconds. On December 28, 2014, Leela cried power. Today, on March 28, 2023, we cry power too. Thank you. Our next speaker is Addison McGinty, Finn Spruill, and then Alex Esterot. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Addison Ginty. I'm a senior at Fort e. Kellum High School, and I am speaking here in response to the 2022 model policies. Let's think about this. Abiding in this policy is a blatant violation of the Virginia Human Rights Act. The said act of the Commonwealth is to as follows, quote, safeguard all individuals within the Commonwealth from unlawful discrimination because of race, color, religion, natural origin, sex, pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, age, martial status, sexual orientation, gender identity, military status, or disability in places of public accommodation, including educational institutions and in real estate transactions. To paraphrase, phrase. The act states the protection of all individuals regardless of sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation from unlawful discrimination by dictionary definition, quote, the discrimination of basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in public settings or educational institutions, which is exactly what this trans policy is pertaining in. Discrimination is an issue that has been well known and highly present within the history of our country and our state even now. Just recently, in a study completed by the Movement Advancement Project in partnership with the National Center for Transgender Equality, National Education Association outlined the bullying and discrimination transgender students experience in the United States public schools. The study showed large percentages of trans students feeling unsafe in the local public schools because of their gender expression. Is this really the reputation you want to leave for VBCPS? The reputation where students are physically afraid to step foot into your schools because of their identity, let me put this into perspective. If somebody who wasn't part of the transgender community wanted to go by a nickname, it would be easy for you to refer to them as that. But with the youth within the trans community, you are willing to blatantly disregard what they choose to go by. This is an account of discrimination even even outside of this policy, VBCPS is constantly treating these individuals differently. Another study completed just this week notes that while many schools do provide safe and supportive learning environments for transgender students, only 13 states, including Washington, D.C., have laws that explicitly ban discrimination in schools based on their gender identity and sexual orientation. This report comes in the wake of the Department of Justice's and the Department of Education's joint rescission of guidance that seconds. clarified transgender students' protections under Title I-X of the Education Amendments of 1972, which prohibits sex discrimination in federally funded education programs or activities to ensure equal educational opportunity. Virginia happens to be one of these 13 states protected by this law. However, this policy explicitly goes against it. VBCPS claims to value difference, diversity, and strives to create a more equitable learning environment, but this policy doesn't show difference and diversity. It shows discrimination. I ask that you practice. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Finn Spruill, then Alex Estrad, then Jay Cruz. Welcome. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Finn Spruill. I'm a transgender male, and I attend Kempsville High School. I'm speaking today in hopes of making nicknames available on printed out rosters. I will keep this short and simple. I came here two weeks ago today and explained how including nicknames and synergy on the printed out roster would eliminate backlash amongst transgender students. Although this may not seem like a big deal, high schools are different than how they were when you were a, high, when you were a student. More and more students feel comfortable coming out in school, so we must act accordingly. If you are not transgender, you may not understand the fear that comes with substitutes, new teachers, or roll call, but those who are will. I am lucky to have the power to speak for myself, whether, whether it is as simple as speaking in front of my class or coming here today in hopes of 
in hopes of helping you understand how I feel. I truly believe all of you want each of your students to feel equal and have a sense of belonging. I'm sure listening to these students come to these meetings to speak and to come to you in a vulnerable state cannot be easy, but all we want to, all we want to feel is safe and valued. And in order to obtain this, you must listen to the people speaking here today. You must understand what they say, and you must act accordingly. You must make changes where changes are due. Something as simple as adding my name in parentheses is a minor change for you, but means the world to me. Listen to the people and realize the little changes lead to big things. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Astrod, Jay Cruz, and then Lana Waters. Welcome. Thank you. At this point, I don't know what's been left unsaid. It's been about six months now that we've been attending these meetings. And for the entirety of these meetings, we have focused on one goal and one goal only, to assure our transgender classmates can go to school and feel safe. I feel like I have said every word about that I can about these model policies and how I feel about them. So you may ask, why am I here today? At this point, the reason I'm here isn't even to convince you how to vote. It's been six months, and we've bombarded you with 20 or more speakers for the past few meetings, all speaking in unity on one issue. I'm sure you have your opinions by now on the model policies. And I'm here because a few meetings ago, I made a promise to myself and this board. I said, until these policies go away, we will stay. And I will continue spending sleepless nights pondering over speech ideas. I will take hours out of my day to make sure everyone can make it to the meeting, and I will forever stand up for my transgender and non-binary peers. Because if these policies were to be put into place and I stopped fighting, I could not live with the guilt. I cannot in good faith sit by as my transgender classmates' smiles slowly decay as days go on. I cannot sit by te as teachers are forced to dead name the students if they have spent the whole year calling by the preferred name. And I cannot sit by and watch as Governor Youngkin continues appointing people from other states to determine what is best for Virginia and Virginia Beach. I am well aware at this, that at this point, you believe that there's nothing you can do related to these model policies as they have yet to be enacted. However, that's far from the truth. Any day now, you could assure us, assure constituents, and assure transgender students all across Virginia Beach that you will not let the VDOE dictate their identities. You can assure us that all students can feel safe in Virginia Beach public schools. You can assure us that we will be live by Virginia Beach values, not by those of Tennessee or Wyoming. Just because nothing is yet to be enacted does not mean that there is nothing to fight. These model policies represent a scary future for transgender students, and their lives should not be left in the balance as the VDOE drags their feet. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jay Cruz, and then Lana Waters. Welcome. Good evening, board members. I know the discussion around these policies has gotten quite long in the tooth, so I'm going to try and keep it simple for you. I'd just kind of like to show you something I've observed over the weekend. I had the great privilege of going to this VHSL state forensics tournament this weekend, and one of the competitors in my category briefly mentioned to us that they are non-binary. Now, if we're to listen to some of the hysteria around this topic, we'd imagine that this would derail the whole competition or this would be some kind of massive distraction or that this would in any way inhibit us from doing what we're there to do, to compete and show who can be the best speaker. This did none of those things. This student placed second. They were a perfectly lovely person to talk to. And they earned that placement because they were a talented speaker, not because they were trans, not because of any other trait other than their ability in this competition. That's the ideal that we're seeking here. And those who try and say that we're pushing some kind of radical agenda or trying to transform our schools utterly just miss the point of everything that we fight for. All we want is equal opportunities for all students. Now, you might not agree with the route that we take to get there. In fact, I'm sure some of you completely disagree. I'm sure there are speakers that are going to after me that are going to say that my route to getting to this goal is ridiculous. But Let's keep in mind that that's the ideal that we're striving for here, is equal opportunity for all students. That all students who walk into a forensics room to compete, regardless of their pronouns or their gender identity or any other trait about them, can be on equal footing and can get an equal chance. That's all we're fighting for here. Students who have the names that they want to go by, regardless of whether they're trans or not. 
students to just be comfortable where they are and to succeed for all of the merits that they have. My dad was a pilot in the Navy and he told me one of his favorite things about his job was no one cared about anything about him. No one cared about the fact that he was Filipino or the fact that he was an immigrant or whatever. They just cared how well he could land the plane on the aircraft carrier. That's exactly how I see this and that's exactly how I want school to be for all of my peers. I want them to be assessed and to succeed off of how well they can do the tasks that are put in front of them. I want every forensics tournament to be about how well the speakers can speak. I want every debate tournament to be about how well the debaters can debate. And that's all we're seeking here. We're not trying to transform our schools. We're not trying to turn everything upside down. We are just pursuing measures that we think will make every student equal and will give them the greatest chance to succeed. So, pl 30 seconds. so please support us in our goals. And even if you disagree with us, try and keep that goal in mind in the end that we are just pushing for students to have the best chances they can to show us what they have. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lana Waters. Welcome. Thank you, good evening. My name is Lana Waters. I'm a senior at Kempsville High School and I will also be talking about the 2022 model policies that I strongly oppose. Every day since the last time I attended a school board meeting, I've seen a new article talking about politicians, laws, and rules that threaten transgender people in America. This recent wave of anti-trans hate uh, is terrifying and disgusting. The school board has a chance to make one positive change for kids in Virginia by simply not implementing these new model policies. The very essence of being a kid is to be still figuring yourself out. Everyone should be given room to grow and change, to ask questions, and to try out something new. We shouldn't make rules that restrict how a student is able to grow and discover new things about themselves. This is not to imply that being transgender is a phase, but to encourage you to think about how this model policy would rob students of that ability to be a kid and to figure out their identities in their own time, to find out what makes them comfortable in their own skin. Additionally, kids are supposed to be protected while they're at school. They are supposed to feel safe and surrounded by adults that they can confide in and trust. With all the hate directed towards transgender people in the world today, how could a teacher in good conscience break this trust and inform parents that their child is questioning their gender? They don't know the student's home life or their parents' opinions. How could they be required to have parent permission to call a student another name, knowing getting this permission could put the student in harm's way? This model policy would, be, would put students with transphobic families in danger. I have heard many people depend, defend this model policy by saying the old one is neglecting parents' rights. That by teachers calling a student a different name or pronouns without approval from parents, they're excluding parents from this decision and alienating, alienating them from their child. This could not be more untrue. No one is alienating parents from their children except for the parents. It's so much easier to be truthful about your identity than it is to live inauthentically. But as I mentioned before, we don't live in a world that's always supportive and respectful towards trans people. If a student wants to come out to their parents, they will on their own time. But if a student is coming out to their teachers and not their parents, there is a reason. Whether that's because they're not prepared, they're trying to find the right time, or their parents are hateful towards trans people, we don't know. What we do know is that that is the student's seconds. information uh, to choose when and where and with who to share and nobody else's. I implore you to think about these points and reconsider the 2022 model policies. Thank you very much for your time. Madam Chair, that was our last student speaker. Our next speakers will be Vincent Smith, Brenda Pence, and then Carol Kinsey. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Vincent Smith. I'm here from District 5 to speak in support of the return of valedictorian, salutatorian, and class rankings. You know, some students do care about these awards. Um, they've, they've worked hard for their entire career as a student. Some of their parents care. They've, they've probably gone to school sick to avoid having absences that affect their grades. Um, there are students in every one of your high schools that actually achieved this. If you vote against this, you're choosing to just not tell them. You're choosing to not reward them for their hard work. And I just, I think that's wrong. Um, I think it's also insufficient to argue that you have a couple of academies that have a different grading scale 
you have quite the mathematical faculty here that we pay a lot of money. And you know, if you can't put all those heads together and figure out a way to adjust for that, well, you need to take a look at why you can't do that because it's really a pretty simple thing to do. If you need some help, give me a call. Um, if you can't figure that problem out, you can actually have separate graduations for these academies that are on a different grading scale. Colleges and universities do that every year. Um, I'd also like to tell you that this is a 251-year-old tradition in this country of awarding valedictorian. Um, we've only had U.S. elections for 235 years, so this, this lasts, has lasted longer than our government has. Um, these students worked hard. You worked hard on your campaigns. These students studied. You went out and gave speeches. These, student took, these students, they took tests. Um, we had an election. Um, their tests were graded. The votes were counted. If you're not going to tell these students which ones won, maybe we shouldn't tell y'all which one of y'all won the election. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Brenda Pence, then Carol Kinsey, then Katherine Taylor. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Brenda Pence, a retired Virginia Beach school teacher and a concerned citizen. Five months ago, an article titled, Should Schools Notify Parents If Their Child Claims to Be Transgender? It appeared on the Alliance Offen Defending Freedom website, relating a true story that is repeating itself all across America. The father, Wendell Perez received a call from the elementary school that his 12-year-old da daughter had attempted suicide in the school's bathroom. He was told she wanted to be a boy with a male name and pronouns. But there had been no signs of gender dysphoria in the home. Until just a few years ago, true gender dysphoria Severe discomfort in one's biological sex was rare and vanishing. Starting at a very young age, it mostly corrected itself by puberty. It appeared in less than 0.01% of the population, affecting boys almost exclusively. Does this sound like Wendell and Maria's daughter? Not at all. So where did their young daughter get the idea that she could become a boy? We certainly can blame social media trends like through apps like TikTok. But what the parents didn't know was that school officials were having confidential meetings with their young daughter to discuss her discomfort with her gender. Teachers and staff were treating their daughter as a boy. When the parents asked why they were not notified, the staff claimed, it's confidential. This is deception at its best and insanity at its worst. Question, can you tell me why our public school staff believe it's their mission to aid in the gender transitioning of any child through secret counseling and hosting assemblies highlighting the transgender story? What authority do they have? It certainly is not in the school's mission statement. So if schools assume the right to help a child transition, are they, by default, responsible for the outcomes, the damage done to a child, the medical bills incurred, seconds. the psychological harm? Yes, schools are responsible for their actions, and I trust the parents, Wendell and Maria, are suing. Stop the insanity in Virginia Beach. Parents are not the enemy. I urge you to vote yes for Governor Youngkin's 2022 transgender policies to restore parental rights to protect their children in the schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Kinsey, Katherine Taylor, and then Becky Hay. Welcome. Good evening. First, I'd like to congratulate each and every one of the school board members and the superintendent. In researching my speech, I was amazed at the numerous award, awards and recognitions y'all have received throughout your careers. 
I know these accolades were earned through your hard work, diligence, and perseverance. Key word, earned. They were not handed to you. These three positive characteristics are those which one works at daily to achieve the awards, all good qualities of good citizens. Good citizens like the awards we designate to our elementary school students for kindness, cooperation, etc. Earned awards which the middle schoolers receive for student of the month. I could tout all the awards and recognitions for so many in our school system, but that would take hours. The point is, we don't achieve success but through striving to do our very best. And that best, whether it be in sports, the arts, or academics, needs to be recognized. It's just not a title. Why wouldn't we desire to applaud those who rise to the occasion, as you all have with your recognized achievements? <clears throat> those who achieve inspire others to do their very best. Let's not leave the encouragement behind for our students to achieve their optimal potential. Promoting the same kinds of success for our students now and in the future warrants not only strong and consider, careful consideration and reflection of what these awards stand for, but also reinstatement of Val Sal. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katherine Taylor, then Becky Hay, then Cherise Drysdale. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Katherine Taylor and I work for Virginia Beach City Public Schools. As a middle school librarian, I want to nurture my students' curiosity and help them develop skills that will prepare them for AP classes, college, and beyond. I want them to understand it's their job as citizens to analyze what they read to distinguish between fact, casual opinion, and even misinformation. I want to help students develop their critical and creative thinking skills so they can problem solve and find solutions to real world issues. These are my priorities as a librarian. In the past two weeks in our library, we created learning stations for students so they could analyze historic events and examine the effects on our nation. We guided our AVID students through their college and career research and hosted a fair so they could share what they learned. We worked with eighth grade students in small groups to prepare them for the writing SOLs. Challenging students and helping them grow as learners are my priorities as a librarian. I also checked out many library books to students. I regularly interview students about their interests with the singular goal of finding them a book they will become engrossed in. I want them to find a book they love and I want them to love reading. That's one of my priorities as a librarian. My question for the school board is, what are your priorities? Instead of focusing on library policies, the school board should be prioritizing class size. I'm a proud aunt, but I'm sad to say that none of my family members attend VB public schools. My nieces and nephew were not withdrawn from VBCPS because of library policies. One of the reasons for that decision was the large class sizes and the lack of individualized attention. The reduction of class sizes is an important topic for the school board discussion and should be a priority. The school board should also be prioritizing staff retention, another problem not caused by library policies. There are jobs that continue to go unfilled and many teachers are leaving the profession. This school board needs to develop policies that focus on the recruitment of new teachers and the retention of experienced ones and it needs to support practices that foster a positive working climate. As school board leaders, you set the tone and mood for our district, and we need a positive culture. Instead, the focus on library collections seems to be feeding a negative culture and shifting attention from significant issues in our division. Finally, I've been thinking about school safety a lot, and I don't even know where to begin. The answers, though, must come from the top. The school board's number one priority must be school safety and the policies you develop must reflect that. This is something that cannot be delayed. If our staff and students don't feel safe in school, learning seconds. will not happen no matter what other policies are in place. My heart is broken about what happened yesterday. The board must act now to help prevent something like this from happening again. So tonight I ask the board, what are you doing for the teachers and staff? What are you doing for the students? And what are your priorities? Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Hay, then Cherise Drysdale, then Lindsay Riley. 
Welcome. As a parent of four students, including two graduates of Virginia Beach and a current senior, I'm in favor of reinstating Valsal in class rank immediately, not waiting until next school year. There are still scholarships my senior can apply for now where he will be able to utilize his class rank. My eldest was eligible for scholarships as a 2018 graduating senior by being in the top 10% of his class. The college he chose to attend awarded scholarships to those students in contention for Valsal. My current senior has been accepted to that same school and that same scholarship still exists. A common rebuttal to Valsal recognition is that it does not impact college admission decisions. I disagree. In the most competitive schools, any academic distinction a student can provide distinguishes them from other students. We should be encouraging students to use every tool and resource available to chase their dreams, which often includes attending a prestigious college, university, or military academy. Allowing a student to, dis to include their class rank and or the designation of valedictorian or salutatorian re reinforces a job well done. This district often says it wants to reinforce positive behaviors. And the reinstatement of these designa designations are the ultimate in that effort. Another rebuttal to Val Sal is that the Latin honor system is what colleges are now using and is more applicable. However, I suggest we can encourage a both and mentality. The Latin honor system allows for more students to receive acknowledgement for their hard work and excellence, yet retaining class ranking in Valsal allows for special mention of those who reach the top of their class. These titles, in addition to class rankings, encourage healthy competition between peers and grow life skills such as persistence, hard work, and diligence. They also prepare students for the competitive workplace environment they will face one day. Companies of all kinds have Employee of the Month awards, Employee of the Year, top sales awards and other competitions that breed excellence and innovation in their employees. Why shouldn't we introduce that mindset to our students now while in school? Students who work hard to achieve top grades in their class deserve to be honored. We have no pro problem recognizing top athletes, so why not top academics as well? Students know there are winners and losers in life and that they will be good at some things and not others. It's our job as parents and educators to help students find the things they are good at and to invest in those pursuits. We should not be eliminating the recognition of student excellence at the conclusion of their formative academic careers. Rather than eliminating Valsal and student rankings, we should be teaching students seconds. that success is attainable even without a special designation on their transcript. We've all heard about successful entrepreneurs who didn't do well in school but who used their creativity to achieve great things after their formal education. However, these stories never tear down or negate the hard work or achievement of their highly ranked academic peers. Please reinstate Valisal and student rankings for our current students. It fosters the best in our students and rightly congratulates those who successfully finished at the top. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cherie Strysdale, then Lindsay Riley, then Christy McNally. Cherie Strysdale. Lindsay Riley. Yes, it's me. Welcome. School board members, Dr. Spence, administration, it's a privilege to speak before you to advocate for students pursuing the highest of academic excellence. My name is Christy McAnally, and I've been an educator for 30 years, currently in my 22nd year in Virginia Beach, and um, counting down for retirement June 16th. My children are products of Virginia Beach Public Schools, having attended Lanstown Elementary, Lanstown Middle, and Lanstown High School. With that being said, having kids at Lanstown High School for 10 years, I continued attending graduations long after mine had graduated. I followed my sixth graders from Lanstown Middle and attended their graduations, and how proud I was many times when one of my former students was bestowed the honor of valedictorian or salutarian. And like all teachers, I was so excited that I had played a small part in their journey to get there. For me, the best part of graduations are the speeches of the top two of the class as they leave inspiration, memories, and advice as a farewell to their classmates. And I know you all have attended more graduations than any of us, and I'm sure you can agree that that is a highlight of the graduation. 
The tradition of selecting a valedictorian goes back to colonial times, back to 1772 at the College of William and Mary. It was the top prize given to a graduating senior for scholarship, the key word being scholarship. In recent years, the role of valedictorian has come into question, and it was a sad day in Virginia Beach when it was discontinued. We give out MVP awards for athletes and top athletic awards, recognizing athletes that work the hardest and prove themselves in the athletic arena, my children being those that got those athletic scholarships. And we recognize many athletes here tonight. Yet here we are in the business of education, and we pull the opportunity away from the best and the brightest. For those students that make academics a priority, their sport is academia, and they should equally be rewarded by the top two of their graduating class. Every student in our division has an opportunity to go to an academy, to take advanced seconds. placement classes, and this help pays the way for the top awards. They work hard and they sacrifice. Having the valedictorian title will not get them into college as it has decided long before, but I promise you having those titles opens many doors and opportunities. I hope that you will honor those efforts by bringing them back. Um, what is the purpose of being an educator if we aren't helping our kids rise to the top? Please vote in support of students that earn this recognition. Not everyone can be the quarterback because there's only one. And that is time. Thank you for allowing me to serve this division for all these 22 years. And our years. next speaker. It's been a great ride. That is time. And our next speaker is Amy Solares, Andy Bond, and then Diana Howard. Welcome. For years, every chance several of you on this board have got, you've shoved down our throats that you are former educators and that you support teachers and students in education, yet you have voted to take away one of the most prestigious achievement awards our students can attain, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Anderson, and Ms. Riggs. As former educators, this is completely opposite of what an educator should stand for. And at the beginning of this meeting, we saw several of, we saw, we sat through several awards for some uh, staff members and the sports teams. Yet you've taken away for the brightest students. I've heard the excuses that colleges and universities don't use titles when looking at applications, certain classes and academies way more than others, and that we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings if they don't get it. Whether or not colleges and universities consider the recognitions is irrelevant. Students strive to earn these distinctions, as was just pointed out to you by Ms. Kinsey, all the awards you guys got. You've earned them. These students fight to earn these distinctions. They can get scholarships, as Becky just said. School boards and former educators at the least should be looking to motivate our students to do better, do more, achieve more, try harder. If academy classes weigh more than others, then figure it out. As Vincent pointed out, he'll help you. He'll help you if you need it. For those of you within the sound of my voice, please take note. The taking away of these recognitions is just another step down the equity trail. And I, for one, am tired of this focus on feelings instead of academics. Taking away Val Sal has told these high achieving students they don't matter. Ms. Melnick, with all due respect, two thirds of the constituents in your own district didn't want you sitting on this board because they don't agree with your decisions and this is one of them. So I'm asking you and everyone else to please reinstate the valedictorian salutatorian recognitions. Thank you. Excuse me, please uh, refrain from clapping and disturbing us, thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bond, then Diana Howard, then Kathleen Slindy. Good evening, great to see you all. Welcome. Thank you. American society rewards people who perform at the highest levels. This allows America to positively affect the world. And isn't that what we want our kids to do? The task students are performing is studying 
And so really the best thing we can do is recognize them in their striving for that by calling them out when they attain the highest and next to highest levels. Think of the rewards America uh, gives to people who have had effect of the, on the world. Think of Musk, Zuckerberg, Bezos, Edison, Alexander Graham Bell. We do this because we want to reward current excellence. But we also want to encourage future excellence. And it's not always financial. Salutatorian, valedictorians, that there's no financial gain there uh, in the name, perhaps with a scholarship or something, but not in the name. Ben Franklin didn't patent his Franklin stove. So he didn't get rich off of that. There was no financial reward for inventing that. But there's certainly a reward. They don't call it the Bond stove. They call it the Franklin stove. So it works. And you all know this. Sometimes even a name on a marquee will work. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Diana Howard, then Kathleen Slindy. Speaker 13 had to cancel, so then it would be Kristen Herrera. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. How y'all doing today? I'm Diana Howard. I'm the chair of the Virginia Beach Tea Party, and we're in favor of reinstating Valvatorian Salvatorian. I fail to understand why we can recognize everybody from um, teachers to superintendents to, you know, anything here every week, but you want to take away this one achievement for uh, academic excellence. We're all not equal. We have different talents. Some kids excel in the arts, some in academics, some in sports, but you don't want to recognize them in academics. I don't understand that. We all have to compete for jobs when we get out of school. Competition is something that we have to learn. You compete to be on the sports teams, you compete for um, awards in, in the arts. And so why not Valvatore and, and Salvatore? I don't understand that, okay? Kids will get good um, positions on you know, college acceptance and stuff. They get, you know, uh, what do you call it, scholarships and things like that. So it's something that you should do. There's nothing wrong with awarding the kids that achieve these goals. Why not let them reach? If they have nothing to compete for, then they won't give that extra effort. They won't try harder. I mean, why not set the bar high so they all have something to reach for? Even if they don't win, it makes them all better for having achieved it, for having tried, for having excelled. Don't take that away from these kids. They have the right to be rewarded for their achievement. Thank you. Can I ask a staff member to remove the sign on the podium, please? Thank you. Yep. Our next speaker will be Kathleen Slindy, then Kristen Herrera. Welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, School Board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Kathleen Slindy, and I serve as the President of the Virginia Beach Education Association. Tonight, my comments will address some of the bylaws and policies on the agenda for information. The first is Bylaw 132, Section C number three, which states the school board may amend, uh, adopt, amend, or re repeal a policy, and then it inserts the phrase, at the same meeting when first presented, if there is, and continues an affirmative vote of seven of the school board members, if there are 11 school board members present at the meeting, or an affirmative vote of a majority of plus one. Well, I have heard many members of this board talk about how important it is to allow the public to comment on issues. So I do not think changing a bylaw or policy should be done without allowing time for public input. Allowing the, those employees affected by the change to voice their concerns about 
or their support for the change is important. Surely it is a better practice to involve those affected by the changes in the decision-making process, especially when there is currently no contract negotiation practice. Collective bargaining would allow for employee input and result in a decision that will, all affected parties could support. The second agenda item uh, or th a policy is policy 4-5, which addresses notification of superintendent when child protective services charges are filed against an employee. VBA wants language added ensuring that the VBCPS employee is notified when a CPS investigator will be in attendance at a meeting when it is necessary so that the employee can arrange to have representation. Because we all know that all public employees have Garrity rights. You would think this would not be an issue. However, as an example, an employee was told by employee relations to come to a meeting to turn in their badge and upon arrival was confronted with an investigator from CPS. The employee was a VBA member and so did have the counsel of a representative to uphold the Garrity rule. VBCPS has an obligation to follow the law on behalf of their employees' interests. VBA is happy to work with the Policy Review Committee in developing language to make sure all parties are protected. Third policy is 5-56, which is going to be renumbered, and it's called Duties and Responsibilities of Professional Teaching Staff. Uh, this may seem a little radical, but to this policy, I would advocate that language that supports the idea that additional duties and responsi responsibilities should be accomplished within contract hours. For example, number five might say, parents are responded to, uh, are responded to in seconds. a timely manner, and you would add within contract hours. The fourth agenda item is policy 4-34. It's called the per Personnel Protection from Assault um, and other acts. The VBA would like to work with the PRC in developing a section of this policy that would add protection to the educator when they are assaulted by a student. The policy focuses on all the reports an employee must file, not on providing protection for their safety or health. We would like to establish a protocol on how to handle the situation. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Herrera, then Kelly Caras Fowler, and then Jimmy Faust. Welcome. Thank you, good evening. I'm an elementary teacher here in Virginia Beach and as all of our hearts are super heavy with the news from Nashville, I would like to voice concerns that are of the utmost importance related to our school safety. By March 28th of this year, 129 mass shootings have occurred in our country. There have been 13 school shootings across the nation this year that have resulted in injury or death, which averages out to one shooting a week. As a teacher, I'm concerned for my students and myself. I would like to urge the district to take a proactive approach to ensure that we will not be added to the district or to the statistic. We don't accurately prepare our students for active intruder situations. We practice hiding and lockdown drills, but then tell staff when the situation occurs, we run to anywhere that's not the school. Our younger students need practice and routine, and I'm not confident that they would be able to turn away from what they practice when an emergency situation is occurring. In response to the Newport News situation, families received an email about discussing safety issues with their students and to help them understand, see something, say something. At our school, we received a safe schools training in which we were told various things that were not reassuring, such as, in case of an active shooter, run with your kids, but it's a race that you're running to lose. If you're hiding and can attack, attack and make sure the shooter doesn't breathe again. If there's a gun on campus, don't call 911, call the office so that they can call 911 because you would need to know what you're gonna say if you call 911. And top priority after an incident is ensuring all staff members are on campus the next day to be able to support the students. This email and training are not enough to ensure the safety of everyone on each campus. These children deserve to go home to their families each day. Our teachers are also sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, and deserve to go home to their families each day. I deserve to go home to my family each day. When I signed up to teach children, I did not sign up to be a target of an attack or to lay down my life for someone else. I signed up to teach. And while I love my students with all my heart, I don't feel that this, the expectation of the community or the district should be that I trade my life for my students. So what actions can we take to ensure that every child and staff member are safe in our schools? How are we going to adequately prepare everyone in the building for life-threatening emergencies? 30 seconds. 
attempting to implement something is better than being complacent and saying or thinking we've done enough. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kelly Converse Fowler, then Jimmy Faust, then Don Labar. Kelly Fowler, okay. Jimmy Frost, Don Labar. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the board for um, everything that you guys do for the students. I know that you are here because you want to do what's right for the students. Um, I'm not here to talk about the uh, valedictorian or um, school safety. I'm just here to ask for two things. As a, um, as a parent of Virginia Beach City Public School students and a Virginia Beach resident, I would like to have the policies that are currently in place to continue. Whereas a transgender person can be called by the name of their choosing and that they can go to their counselor without any kind of restrictions. I think that that's what's right, and I think that that's what's safe, and it has been working. So I think we should continue that. I don't understand why all of these students come for the last six months and, and tell you, here's what we're seeing. There's, there's teachers that come, there's parents that come, and we're all telling you the same thing, but there's been no action. Um, and I don't know why. Um, but I, will, I hope that you will make a decision soon and that you will make a compromise and allow the kids to be called what they like to be called and give everybody the right to see their counselor. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paulette Reed, then Calvin Reed. Paulette Reed. Calvin Reed. Okay, Madam Chair, we're going to move on to our online speakers. Our first online speaker is Paula Chang. Please unmute. Can you hear me all right? Yes, welcome. Thank you. Um, earlier this evening, a young student speaker spoke about how she was not anticipating spending her senior year here speaking about her desire for what she sees as equitable treatment for students. I could, see, stay, uh, sorry. I could say the same, as I'm here to speak for equitable treatment of students, and that is why I support the return of Val Salen Class Ranked Policy 529. At school board meetings, we have heard the school board and administration proudly tout the academic accomplishments of the BBCPS as reflected in testing results of our students. This board and administration accept the accolades of the work of these students in testing and use them to claim our system as superior to others statewide. So, you will recognize number one for yourselves. But these accomplishments are the results of the work of the students with faculty. And while you accept the accolades of their work, you deny the students who reflect well on you the recognition inherent in Val Sal and class rank. One asks why. You have signing days for athletic recognition for the arts. You have Latin honors to acknowledge the work of the many yet deny the individual honor for those hardworking students who academically excel. Why deny this exceptional recognition? And why do you deny the success of all students of all races and all socioeconomic background this success? It is not fair as there's always a number one. In the February and March policy review committee meetings, the chair and Mrs. Brown worked hard with Mrs. Anderson and the administration to develop verbiage about this policy upon which all were agreeable, forming the compromise which all agreed upon. Mrs. Anderson should follow through and vote tonight affirmatively as she voted to send this verbiage to policy to the full board. A quick word for all students in the audience. Mrs. Anderson stated at the PRC meeting that students do not care about Valsal and paraphrasing that students work to achieve such accolades, they do it only for their parents, not themselves. What an insult to all students in the VBCPS and what a low level of respect she confers on the students who work hard and whom she is supposed to elevate. I personally see self-motivated students here meeting after meeting, working for what they believe, what they want to achieve. Their parents did not send them. As this school board votes on Val Salen class rank this evening, I hope you remember that it is wrong for you in the system to accept the glory of their work, but deny that glorious recognition to them and their families 
and their work as they achieve uh, college recognition, there will always be a number one. And if you doubt that, look at yourselves. 30 seconds. Each of you on that dais set a goal for yourself and work to be chasing number one to be on this board. You sat around on election night as students do throughout the year to see if you became the valedictorian of your district to sit on the dais. So I would recommend you do the right thing. You be fair and you be equitable. Thank you. Our next online speaker is Ken Lubeck. Please unmute. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. So first thing I wanna mention is I, um, I think we need to um, split the word equity into two definitions. One is equity of opportunity, and that's why we have public schools. And the other one is equity of outcomes. And that's, that's problematic because that's not how the world works. Um, so I, I will circle back to this, this idea of equity of opportunity and why we need to focus on that. But first I wanna mention just as a personal uh, anecdote, I, I have two daughters in two different high school academies. Uh, my senior uh, received a, uh, a $5,000 STEM scholarship for a woman of color in STEM, and she's got about 24 AP credits. So it looks like we can even save on a whole year of college. So that's fantastic. Everyone doesn't have to go into a million dollars of debt. Um, and uh, both my, I asked both my daughters about this, and they have no problem with reinstating Val Sal. And um, they don't have a problem with knowing what their class rank is. And I, me personally, I found I was not a good high school student. I was a very good, uh, when I got out of the Navy, student at uh, TCC, ODU, and Regent, and, and had a great GPA. But in high school, I was fairly apathetic, middle-of-the-road kid, and I found out my class rank, and I was in the middle, right where I deserved to be, and it really didn't hurt my feelings, because um, that's what I deserved. So, um, you know, I think maybe one of the compromises might be to have two sets, one for academy kids and one for non-academy kids, because I do understand that there's more AP opportunities for the academy kids, and that will allow them to have an advantage to win Val Sal. But people like to know, oh, this person was number one, and, uh, you know, my daughters aren't going to win it. They're going to be, one of them might be top five or ten at Bayside this year, and the other one, who I don't know. It's up, it's up to her. So um, it, it's a good thing. And another thing, I went to the um, convention center when all the universities were there, college night, and we walked up to William and Mary, and guess what? We kept asking the admissions persons, what's important? What's important to get in? What's important to get in? And she finally goes, she goes, you know, class rank is really, it is important for William and Mary. And I just looked at her and said, well, we don't do that anymore. And she looked at me like I was nuts. Um, I know you can get the number, I think mm -hmm. it's kind of yes. hard, but why not allow kids to either by default get their class rank or they can click a button in the system and they can get their class rank and other kids don't have to look at it if they don't want to. So I know I only have 17 seconds left and I do think there should be an officer in every elementary school and um, congratulations to the PA girls in basketball. It, that's a meritocracy. They work hard. That coach is awesome. He's a gem for Virginia Beach. Thank you. Our next online speaker is Robert Dean. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Robert Dean, and I'm speaking this evening as chairman of the Tidewater Libertarian Party. Addressing the school board policy 5-29, which as presented to the board, included the reinstatement of the designation to determine the valedictorians and salutatorians for graduating classes. In all specs of the business and military world, employees and service personnel are rewarded for their appraisals of performance based on being productive workers, maintaining or preferably exceeding the requirements to fulfill the job description, and in the final analysis, achieving the challenging goals in order to remain an employee. Corporate American before that, the United States Marine Corps, are my personal frames of reference. Both of those entities seek out the best personnel in order to get the job done. If you don't perform well, you do not get the recognition needed for advancement or continued employment. Government education needs to establish the highest standards possible for advancing students and preparing them for the workforce. Capitalism and free enterprise have very high standards, and if you do not continue to perform, you will no longer have, have a job. 
Merit is the noun that describes the standard for which all jobs must be judged. That is how our nation historically has advanced. Demanding and recognizing excellence, not mediocrity, are the only standards that should be recognized. Giving everyone the same rating or lack thereof get, makes for an inferior product, in this instance, students attending government schools. When you eliminate distinction, you have eliminated drive and personal challenges that type A behavior students demand for themselves. High standards should be the normal goals for our students, and those who go beyond those standards need to be rewarded. Those academic designations come in the form of VALSAL, a reward for the highest honors and limited to only those who deserve it. Ask any Navy SEAL or late CEO of General Electric, Jack Welch, who during his reign at GE took the company from $12 billion to $410 billion while making 600 acquisitions. The wealth standards of excellence are what we should be instilling in our children, not giving everyone the same rewards in order to avoid hurting their feelings, which destines them for mediocrity. Set high standards, education standards, and return Valsell to the Virginia Beach school system. Corporate America doesn't care about feelings. They care about the return on investment for their stockholders. And the Marines and SEALs have one mantra attributed to General George S. Patton. He who sweats more in training bleeds less in battle. No Valsell, no rewards for any school personnel, period. Have a nice evening. Our next speaker is Vic Nichols. Please unmute. Thank you. Welcome. I was salutatorian of my graduating class. I worked four years, no recognition until graduation. That's it. But yet you have athletes that can be recognized a couple of times during the years. So they get recognized multiple times. Why is there this disparity? People work very hard. These kids work very hard. I know personally how much it took to sit there and work that hard to actually achieve something like that. To sit there and say that basically we're doing away with it because you are worthless, because that's really what it says. Your work is worthless. Um, I have to agree with the um, speaker before me. You know what? If you're going to give trophies out to everybody, how come? The people that work the hardest with the least amount of recognition don't get anything. Well, you know what? If you're going to do that, no trophies for anyone. Thank you. And Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. Thank you. We are on number 12, information. Interim financial statements for February 2023. Welcome, Mr. Hopkins, Director of Business Services. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chairwoman Weems, School Board members, Dr. Spence. As of February 28th, the overall revenue trend remains to be acceptable at this time in the fiscal year as illustrated on the first graph. The General Assembly is scheduled to reconvene on April 12th to go over the budget the options on the table haven't changed much, but it sounded like we will not lose any funding. Um, we will update you after final legislative action. Federal revenues are showing an acceptable trend at this point in the fiscal year. We have received federal impact aid payments of approximately $10 million year to date. Other sources of revenue uh, through the month of February are acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. The next graph shows that the sales tax receipts are at an acceptable level. Year to date through February, we are approximately $3.4 million higher than the same time period last year. March's sales tax is coming in a little lower, about $200,000 than March of last year. And the last graph shows that the expenditures and encumbrances trend continues to remain acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. At this time, I'll take any questions. Ms. Manning. Thank you. I have a few questions um, on page A7 of our document. I understand you may not have the answers to these right now, so you can feel free to get back to me if you don't. Um, there are a couple line items on A7 um, that are over-obligated already, and we're, we're just in March. Um, median communications, 138 
and a half percent obligated, and purchasing services 219 percent obligated, um, to a tune of about a half million dollars total. Um, do you have any? Um, do you know why those are so far over obligated? Uh, these you're looking at the technology category, so that oh okay. okay. So if you come down to the total technology, we're at 73.4 percent. Um, that's the one where you gave me the line item of media and communications. Yep. So if I go up a line under media and communications. Okay. All right. Well, maybe if I could just get an explanation of um, why we're over obligated on those, that'd be great. All right. And then on B11 and B12 on grants funds, I noticed that we have um, specifically three of them that have large dollar amounts in them that we haven't made any expenditures. Bayport Foundation, COPS School Violence Prevention um, are the first two on B11. Um, can someone explain why, what those are for and maybe why we haven't had any expenditures? All right, yeah, I'll have to get the grant manager to discuss when the grant actually started and when we're going to start spending it down. Oh, okay, okay. Because a lot of these don't end this end of this fiscal year. Oh, okay. And then what is on B12, what is V-I-S-S-T-A? You're talking about VISTA? Yeah. You know, I do not remember the acronym. I would have to get for back with you. what it's used for. Anybody? Dr. Spence, do you know? If you can get back to me on that, because right. that, that was another one that hadn't had any expenditure. So if, yeah, I okay. can answer that one. So okay. VISTA is a grant that we get from the state that provides funding to support our pandemic relief. So in the past, it, when we had sa school safety teams, it paid for those personnel. When we had additional nurses, it paid for those personnel. It paid for a number of HVAC units to go in all of our classrooms. And so it's a grant funded through the Department of Education. And uh, right now, our expenditures are related to HVAC equipment because we don't have a need for safety teams, COVID safety teams in our schools. We don't have a need for additional nurses. So the funding right now is for HVAC units, any PPE supplies we st still may need, which again, we really don't need those anymore. So okay. that's what VISTA is. Okay, so we may have some plans for it. We just haven't made any expenditures yet. Well, so that there'll be money that we don't spend. On the VISTA? Yes. Can we use that for security? No. It's it, like what you get with many of the grant funds. It's really specific on what you can use the funds for. And um, so it's, again, it's pretty specific. So okay. Mr. Right. Freeman has got a team working on the different HVAC pieces. And so... Okay, yeah, I know yeah, if I could just get an update on um, maybe some of these grants that we haven't had any expenditures on, that'd be great. Thank you so much. I can answer you one more about Bayport. Okay. We just got Bayport. Oh, okay. Like two months ago, and that, that money's going to go, if I recall correctly, we're going to get uh, a certain amount in the first year, and then it'll be a certain amount the next year, and I think it's three years, and that money's going to go to fund the new wind lab at the ATC. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. No more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So B, local special education annual plan application and report for the Virginia Department of Education. Welcome, Dr. Ronnie Myers-Daub, our Executive Director of Programs for Exceptional Children. Good evening. I have to lower the mic after he left. Okay. Uh, good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chairwoman Weems, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Ronnie Myers Dobb, the Executive Director of Programs for Exceptional Children. I am here this evening to provide information pertaining to the Division Special Education Annual Plan, Part B Flow Through Application and Report, which is often referred to as the annual plan. Tonight's presentation is an annual requirement to inform you of how we intend to spend allocated federal funds based on the requirements outlined in the application. 
The annual plan also serves as a formal agreement between the local school board and Virginia Department of Education, VDOE, for implementing federal and state laws and regulations governing special education programs. Local educational agencies are required to submit this application each year according to the federal provisions of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, as well as state regulations governing special education programs for children with disabilities. Prior to submission to VDOE, each school division must review its annual plan with its local special education advisory committee, also known as SEAC, and submit it to the local school board for approval. We've had some changes in the SEAC member that was gonna be here tonight. Um, Megan Ashburn is actually here. And um, at the end, I'm gonna give her the opportunity to speak, but I wanted to make sure I recognize that she is here and she will be providing the board the committee's response to the division's plan at the end of the presentation. This annual review is critical because the disbursement of federal funds appropriated for the education of children with disabilities is contingent upon the approval of the plan and its components. So a portion of this application includes certification of adherence to a list of assurances delineated by VDOE, which ensures the school division has developed policies and procedures for the provision of special education and related services, which are consistent with policies and procedures that VDOE has established in accordance with IDEA and its federal implementing regulations. Assurances such as those listed on this slide are examples of actions required to maintain compliance with federal and state regulations. The terms free appropriate public education and individualized education program are often heard in the field of special education. These two concepts are specific to each child qualifying for special education services. As each child's IEP is developed and reviewed by the IEP team, determination is made about supports and services needed to ensure access to the general curriculum and to the maximum extent appropriate, the student being educated with peers without disabilities in the least restrictive environment. The school division also has policies and procedures designed to present the over-identification or disproportionate representation by race and ethnicity of children with disabilities. So in addition to the statement of insurances, the annual plan requires the division to submit information about select special education programs and expenditures. One required component is information about the division's jail education program or JEP. State regulations mandate that special education services be provided to incarcerated youth or young adults with disabilities who are in our local jail, the Virginia Beach Correctional Center. Such services are delivered according to the student's IEP by a special education teacher. An interagency agreement is in place to address the staffing and security for those staff. Maintenance of effort, or MOE, is the requirement of each school division to spend at least the same amount of local and state funds on the delivery of special education and related services as spent for the most recent fiscal year. Two additional components are listed on this slide. The first one is the proportionate set aside or PSA. This is the requirement for each school division to set aside a specific federal dollar amount to be used for children with disabilities who are homeschooled or parentally placed in private schools within our jurisdiction. Each year our division hosts the required collaborative consultation session with participating Virginia Beach private schools to determine how best to use the federal set-aside funds. Funds may be used for direct services, consultative services, equipment, or materials. Direct services will again be used for, for the provision of speech and language services due to the strong linkage between speech and language skills and overall literacy. 
The annual plan also requires a recap of the division's use of its federal funds for the prior fiscal year, as well as our anticipated expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year. The division uses federal funds for the intended purposes of the grant, including expenditures for personnel, materials and equipment, and professional development opportunities. This slide breaks down our annual plan's projected budget for 2023-24, Part B, uh, Section 611 and 619 grant funds. VDOE has not yet released official allocations by locality for next year, and divisions are asked to prepare a budget based on level funding with the current year. Our recommended budget is summarized in this chart, and these funds represent approximately 17% of the division's overall special education funding. Part B, Section 611 flow through, also known as Title VI B grant, will continue to support current personnel and benefits and professional development. And Part B, Section 619, Early Childhood Special Education, also known as Preschool Incentive Grant, will also continue to support current personnel benefits, materials, and supplies, and professional development for early childhood special education teachers. Indirect costs for both were calculated at the current rate of 2.2%, and the full details are located in the annual plan application. So as I noted earlier, each school division must review the annual plan with SEAC prior to submission of the plan to the school board and subsequently VDOE. On February 22nd, the plan was shared with SEAC's policy subcommittee, and at the March 20th SEAC evening meeting, the plan was reviewed with those present, and the policy subcommittee garnered SEAC support to move the plan forward. So now I'm going to ask Mrs. Ashburn to come to the podium to provide board members with the committee's response to the proposed plan. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Ashburn with the SEAC, and this is the third time that I've heard this plan. Um, and as a SEAC, we recommend moving forward with the budget plan. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you, and again, I really appreciate Ms. Ashburn coming. We got notification early evening that the person who was going to come wasn't able to attend, so Dodie quickly got on the phone and got Megan to come up here, so I appreciate her support in doing this tonight. So at this point in time, if the board members have any questions, I'm here to hopefully answer them. Ms. Weems. Um, just a big thank you to you, Ronnie, and to all the SEAC members. It, it's um, obviously we agree with you and we need to move forward, but thank you for all the work and especially through the SEAC and partnering with um, Virginia Beach Schools to work together for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. C Policy Review Committee are the PRC recommendations. Welcome, Ms. Linetti, our school board attorney. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cammie Linetti, the school board attorney. And on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I'll be presenting to you recommendations from the Policy Review Committee's March 9th, 2023 meeting. If you read your cover sheet, which I'm sure was the first thing you did when you got your agenda this week, you're going to see that it was a little complicated this time. Apparently, the Human Resources Department decided to challenge the Policy Review Committee by presenting a whole lot of policies, moving some from other sections, and renumbering a lot of policies. So if it looks a little confusing, it may be. I'm going to ask that um, the PRC members, particularly Mrs. Manning, try to keep me straight if I get this wrong. So we're going to try to explain it to you in the most logical manner. The first 10 policies and bylaws that we're presenting are going to be amendments, but some of them do have policy changes within them or they're going to be renumbered. The first one we're bringing to you is bylaw 128, and yes, you do see bylaw 128 multiple times. We're coming back with bylaw 128 this time. We're asking that the school board amended to add the mental health task force as one of the school division's um, 
committees, and then to add the Access Tidewater Foundation, the last section G, and renumber it back in there. The Mental Health Task Force, we do have school board members serving as liaisons on that, that and we don't formally have that into our bylaw. In the Access Tidewater Foundation is an organization, an outside organization that we have had representatives on before. A few years ago, after Mr. Edwards left the board, we did remove that um, group because we didn't feel it was necessary. They've asked for us to have a school board member return onto that, and you heard that mentioned earlier tonight in the um, administrative recommendations as to recommending someone to serve on that. Are there any questions about Bylaw 128? Hearing no questions on Bylaw 128, I'm going to next bring to your attention Bylaw 132, which is adoption, amendment, repeal, or suspension of policies. This actually was a bylaw you've seen, a bylaw you've seen before. However, Mrs. Manning was able to identify that in 2021, you had adopted a section in there, and it was actually an amendment that was made from the floor. It comes up in section C, which is under adoption, amendment, and repeal. Under number three, an amendment was made from the floor. That wording, although you adopted the wording, was not actually incorporated into the online version of the bylaw when it went on in 2021. You did amend this the bylaw again in 2022 when we were redoing all the bylaws, and it was not into that uh, added back into that section. So this time, the, we're bringing it back to your attention that on subsection C, again, adoption, amendment, repeal, subsection three, that it would now return to what it was originally adopted, that the school board may adopt, amend, or repeal a policy, and this is the new language, at the same meeting when first presented, if there is an affirmative vote, and it goes on, but to, uh, the rest is what is it remained in there, an affirmative vote of seven of the school board members, if there are 11 school board members present at the meeting, or an affirmative vote of a majority plus one. Because you amended without that in there 2022, we could not do simply a scrivener's change. So we're gonna ask that you uh, reprove us uh, putting that back in the language as you did originally adopt in 2021. Are there any questions on bylaw 132? Looking at bylaw, uh, which is that, not bylaw, appendix B, which is- Excuse just me, moment, just a moment, I'm Ms. Um, Manny. Yeah, I, I just wanna clarify just to make sure, I know Cami talks a little fast, mm. but this was, um, the language in bylaw 132, Ms. Anderson made the motion and it passed. So for me, because I don't even think that I voted for this um, change, however, for me it's procedural. We did vote for it and it should have been put into the policy and it wasn't. And since we had a change since then, so I'm just asking if you all just procedurally, I think it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to bylaw, uh, Appendix B, which is in your bylaws section. This is the school board standing rules. The recommendation is to amend section D under the formal meetings section. Section D sets out basically the order in which you do your agenda. And we are suggesting in the PRC recommendation under section five, which is the superintendent's monthly report and second monthly meeting that you add and recognitions on the first and second monthly meeting of the month. You have discussed this before, and this is becoming our practice. We wanted to formally um, put that into by Appendix B. There are no other recommendations for Appendix B. Are there any questions on Appendix B? Hearing no questions. Dr. Spence wants to clarify that, please. Yeah, just wanted to clarify. We, it uh, has not been our practice to have recognitions under this section, and it's something that um, I've asked for so that we can change the order of how we recognize newly appointed administrators. So this will allow us to, in the board meeting after you all have taken affirmative action on a new administrator, have them come back so we can recognize them at the beginning of a meeting, rather than as you see what we have tonight, having them wait uh, during the course of the meeting. And so that's really why that's in there. And that's why it says first and second monthly meetings. It just gives us the opportunity to do it whenever the occasion would arise. Thank you, Dr. Spence. If there are no further questions on Appendix B, we'll move on to Policy 4-5, which is criminal or child protective services charges, findings filed against employee notification superintendent. There are some, uh, what I would consider mostly scrivener's changes in the first paragraph, adding some words on there, including investigations and finding. More importantly would be the third paragraph under Section A, we would be adding a, a sentence that said, the employee is responsible for providing any updates or changes in charges, 
court proceedings or appeal processes and must provide a final disposition regarding the felony misdemeanor CPS matter. This has come to attention several times in the last couple of years where we're not getting updates on, on some of this information with the our administrative findings on there and we're asking that the employees make sure that they're giving us information so we can update it because you're aware of the issues that we have to go through as a school board if it affects their license or our ability to retain them. We need that information. So that change is being added there to help us clarify the procedure. So that's simply an amendment to policy 4 or 5. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Mann. So um, I would like to ask that we pull this and send it back to um, policy. We had a speaker this evening, Ms. Slendy, that made some recommendations, and I didn't quite catch what um, those recommendations were that she had for this policy. So I'd like to have an opportunity to talk with her um, before we vote on this. So if we could bring this back to policy review committee just to have her input um, heard by the PRC, I'd, I'd appreciate that if every, everyone's okay with it. Okay, um, thank you. I agree, but Ms. Manny, Ms. Melnick. Um, in addition, she also had um, a statement for bylaw 1-32. So if you could take that back as well. She, also 4-34, we haven't gotten to that one yet, but those were the three she mentioned. She mentioned a fourth one. Anybody write it down? Oh, I did. Um, it might have been 456 dues and responsibilities of professional staff, I think. Yeah. So it reflected within contract hours. 5-56. 4 dash 5 4 dash 5 6 yes. So it was those four. Repeat those, please, one more time. It was bylaw 1 32, policy 4 5, policy 4 34, and policy 4 5 6. Okay. Ms. Manning. I think Ms. Brown was net before me. Oh, Ms. Brown. Okay. So um, I don't mind um, moving back a couple of these, but. Um, bylaw 1-32, and I actually spoke against what was proposed for bylaw 132. A lot of you all um, voted in favor of the change, and the change to be able to change the bylaws at any time was the change. Um, I wouldn't have supported that if I was sitting on the board. I actually had brought it up in the PRC already that I would like to make that change because I didn't like that. Um, I don't like that. I don't think it makes it good for public input. However, um, this body voted, I don't know if it was 7-4 or 8-3, but there was a vote at that time. And so while I don't, rem I don't mind bringing it back to PRC to change that, I I think it's worth noting that at least one, two, three, four um, people sitting on this body had supported it the way that it is, and it is a procedural thing. So that's what I wanted to add. Miss Manny. Yeah, I agree. Um, for me, you know, I think that if we are going to bring this back to reconsider the language, I think that we need to fix the procedural issue first. So I would like for the board to vote on this policy at the next meeting on 132 so that we can fix the procedural issue. And, you know, there are some other things, you know, in this policy that I didn't like and why I didn't, I don't believe I voted for it the first time. But like Ms. Brown said, I think the right thing to do is to fix the procedural issue first. Um, and then we can have it reconsidered in committee. Okay. So we would be moving 132, we'll go to, uh, we'll have to be action for the next meeting, and then we can look at the PRC agenda. Mrs. Manning's working on that right now. She could add that back on, but you would add this to consent agenda for the next meeting. I'm confused. Me too. <laughs> What I'm hearing, but I think I'm hearing, is that you would like 132 to, bylaw 132 to go to 
consent next time to correct the procedural error, but we also have a PRC meeting next week. We can add it to the agenda. We will look to see if there are other changes you want, but I think what I'm hearing is Mrs. Manning is saying we do need to correct the language that should rightfully be in the policy. So we can get this corrected. We can also look at the issues that Ms. Lindy brought up, if that's something else you want to take a look at, but to correct this, and then we'll come back once we have recommendations involving other changes to bylaw 132. Yeah, that's what, I mean, I, I really think we need to fix the procedural, because quite frankly, I don't, I personally didn't think we needed to bring this back to the board, because it's something that the board has already voted on. It should already be in policy. Um, so, I, I just, we wanted, Cami wanted to do the right thing and be extra careful to bring it back to the board so it didn't look like we were making changes, you know, a year and a half after we voted on something. Um, so I really think we need to fix the procedural issue on by one, bylaw 132 first and then consider any changes, if that's okay with the board. So are we going to be voting on action on this next, next time? Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll take bylaw 132, we'll put it on action for the next meeting. We have right now, if Mrs. Manning's agreeable, we can put this on the PRC agenda for the April 5th meeting. I'm not sure we'll be ready by then for the changes, but we may be able to get it done and back to you in a short amount of time. But this will correct it so the policy well, is correct. About no, Jamie, I think the changes are relevant to the language that we need to change procedurally first. So I think that we need to have the board make the changes and then bring it back to the PRC after the next school board meeting. So you want it on consent? With the, with the procedural it's, changes. It's bylaw, it has to be action. So you, action. if you go on April 4th and approve it on action, you would take the now adopted amendment to bylaw 132 and we can bring that on April 5th at the that sounds review good. committee meeting. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we were actually on 4-5, which was the one I asked to send back to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that the one you want? 4-5 goes back? Yes. Okay. All right, so we're moving on to policy 4-10, which is conditions of employment. This is gonna be your first one where it's gonna get a little confusing. So conditions of employment currently is policy 475. There are only some minor scrivener changes for most of it until you get into section E, which is coaching and extracurricular sponsorship con contracts and the Human Resource Department is recommending that under the first paragraph you add a new sentence that reads, individuals shall not perform any coaching duties or extracurricular activities without a valid signed contract on file with the Department of Human Resources. There's also a change that appears further down in Section G, uh, talking about reemployments and breaks in service and a couple of minor Scrivener changes that reflect the, the language on it. With that, that would be the only recommendation that you would now take policy 475 with those amendments and you're going to now amend it to be policy 4-10. And you'll see later on, we will then um, repeal policy 475 as it will now be 4-10 with these amendments. A little confusing, but did that make sense? And do you have any questions? Mr. Culpepper. What, what motivated that addition, uh, that additional paragraph in that policy for uh, right. coaches to have, all coaches to have a, val a contract? So don't we have volunteers? Are they all under? Does that, does there's that actually, um, there's language in the state code about having volunteers. I think we have some volunteers, but the most part, because we want them in a coaching contract to make sure they pay. We also don't want them coming back after us later on seeking reimbursement. That's the, I don't know if Human Resources wants to comment any further on that. Yeah, that, that doesn't compute for me, so I'd appreciate more, more information. It sounds like we're making our, an unnecessary hurdle for people who are volunteering their time and effort. Yes, um, Mr. Culpepper, actually, um, we added that language because although we do have volunteers, we have situations where employment offers have been extended to folks that did not come through the Department of Human Resources, and it's just as Ms. Linetti indicated. Then we are notified that, quote unquote, I began my employment with Virginia Beach City Public Schools on this date, um, and then we're looking at an issue of back payment. That is not the case. Uh, the only department that extends an uh, employment opportunity 
uh, to individuals is the Department of Human Resources. So we just wanted to clarify that language that has absolutely nothing to do with our volunteers, even though they still have to be screened, back che uh, ground checked and fingerprinted, because anyone who's gonna work with our students uh, have to go through that process. So even volunteers for coaches come through our office. Okay, I mean, they, they have to for those, those aspects. So you're gonna write them a contract? Not a volunteer. Volunteers they can't are coach. not contracted. Correct, but unfortunately sometimes that's uh, not the case and or there's some confusion I'm in terms of the difference between a volunteer, which means you're not paid, you're not employed by the division. But volunteers are background checked. If they're gonna be working with our students, um, for safety and security reasons, they have to be background checked. We don't yeah, just let anyone. I'm not in. arguing that point. Right. Are they coaching? Is a volunteer coaching? A volunteer could be assisting the coach. Okay, that's coaching. Are you going to write him a contract? No, we, no, sir. It says he can't coach. You, I'm not trying to quibble terms. I mean, I just think that's what it says. Just, you're um, right. Hey, um, Ms. Woodhouse, I'm wondering, and uh, Cammie, you could probably weigh in here. The distinction is likely that we're talking about paid employment. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so if you just yeah, put that, the word. That would be the clarification. If you just put the word paid in front of coaching, that should take care of the, the issue. I would concur with that. If it says paid coaches without a contract, that clarifies your point, and you have an opportunity to speak to them because you have to do the background check, and you can make sure they understand that so nobody's coming back to you and saying, hey, I've been working for three months. You need to pay me. No, no, I told you. I told you up front. You're a volunteer. Correct. Watch is correct. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. So the recommendation is to put it, the sentence under E, this will be the additional sentence that's been added, would be individuals shall not perform any paid coaching duties or extracurricular activities without a valid signed contract on file with the Department of Human Resources. Is that acceptable? Therefore, can this go on then to um, consent? That answers uh, with my that question, change, yes. yes. I feel like that clarifies it. Very good. All right, moving on to policy 422. 422 is drug and alcohol testing of employees holding a commercial driver's license. There are only what I would call scrivener's changes throughout this particular policy, just changing some of the pronouns and some of the um, formatting and punctuation. We're also removing the editor's notes out of there. Those are the only recommended amendments to policy 422. Are there any questions about 422? Hearing no questions about 422, I will move on to four, what is currently 441, but it's 434, personnel protection from assault and other acts. I do believe this is one of the policies that Ms. Lindy wanted. Do you want me to just send this back, or do you want me to explain it while we're here? Explain it. You can do both. Okay. We'll go on. For personal assaults, there are some, um, really just a minor change in the um, uh, Paragraph, first paragraph that involves a grammatical change. However, the major change would be to renumber this policy from what is currently policy 441 to policy 434. That would be the change, and then of course we'll change 434 later on. So the major change in this one is the renumbering to 440, from 441 to 434. Any questions about that? Hearing no questions about 434, um, do you want me to go explain that you wanted to go ahead and take this back to PRC next week? Yes, please. The next one is salaries and compensation. You'll notice that salaries and compensation is currently listed as 248. It appears in the administration section. The recommendation of the Human Resources Department is, since it's most relevant to human resources or personnel matters, which is section four, as opposed to administration, which is section two, that if someone was looking on the website for it, they wouldn't necessarily know to go to this section. They would probably go to the personnel section. It does make sense in some, in one sense, in that fact that salaries and compensation are something that the school board does when you talk about the school board compensation plan, but human resources felt it would be easier for individuals that work for the school division or the public looking for this section to have it renumbered. So what we we recommending was to take out to policy 2-4, make this policy 435, move it to the personnel section. There are a couple minor editor changes through that, and a change in the reference to one of the policies, but those would be the only recommendations. Are there any questions on what is currently policy 435? 
Hearing no questions on 435, I will move on to 455. Actually, a relatively small policy. This is leave with or without pay for family and medical purposes. It is policy 455. What we're doing is removing the titles in section A and completely removing section B. So there will only be section the one paragraph under section A. So therefore, there was no need for the A and B designations on there. So it's mostly a formatting change and a removal of the second paragraph B, which refers to the regulation references. Are there any questions about the recommendations on 455? Hearing no questions on 455, I'll move on to 456. Again, I do believe this is one of the ones we've circled as one that we may take back, but I will go ahead and explain it. 456 is duties and responsibilities of professional teaching staff. You will not see a significant amount of changes to this because the recommendation is to remove the um, editor's notes at the back, and I'm sorry, I think section B has a change to it. I'm just like, oh no, section B, regulation references, removing title A. You know what? I think that actually belongs to the file. The recommendations, I know I'm going to go, oh, you know what I'm doing? That's because I'm reading. I'm reading the wrong section. 456 is duties and responsibilities, recommends just removing the regulatory references and updating the link. So that is the only recommendation for 456. Are there any questions about 456? Okay. We're going to move on to those. There are only two policies that you need to adopt under this section. Section or policy 427. This is currently policy 737. It appears in the community relations section seven, the very last section of your policies. It's entitled to gifts and staff members. There are only a couple of um, scrivener changes in there correcting some of the pronouns and adding one word. Other than that, the recommendation would be to take policy for 737 out of section seven move it under the personnel section, and renumber it as policy 427. Are there any questions about that recommendation? All right, we'll move on to the next adoption. This is what is currently policy 421. Its title is payment to the state aid of its deceased employees earned accrued leave. There are no recommendations for actually changing the language. They simply want to renumber it now as policy from 421 to policy 443. Are there any questions about that? All right. Now here comes the really easy part. Based on what we just explained to you, we are recommending that policy 428, which is salaries and compensation, be repealed. That policy 421, which you just adopted, would adopt as 443, be repealed. That policy 441, which you've now adopted as 434, be repealed. The policy 475, which you're now going to adopt as 410, be repealed. Let's see if I've got one more. No, nope, a few more. Policy 737, Cami. Yeah. Flip over. Policy 737 would be repealed because you're going to adopt that as 427. Right. Madam Chair. Yes. Sorry, Ms. Manning. Ms. Linetti, I don't believe that we can uh, repeal 4-41 if we're sending 434 back to PRC. We'll need to bring that back for repeal when we bring back 434. That would be a good point. So I need to circle that one. 441. Okay, so we have a little bit of work to do on our PRC agenda for next week, but after that. Okay, yeah, I made some notes. <laughs> Those would currently be the recommendations for this month, and we have one more policy that is coming to you on action in a little while. Thank you, Ms. Lanetti. Okay, okay, there are no more public comments. We've finished that. Now we are on the consent agenda number 14. The following items are on the consent agenda this evening. Resolutions 1, Mathematics Awareness Month, 2, National Month of the Military Child, 3, School Library Media Month and National Library Week, 4, Student Leadership Week, 5, Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll, are there any objections 
to the school board voting on the consent agenda items that I presented. If so, please identify any item right now. Okay. Um, hearing none, I am going to call for an call to move and hearing none, I'm going to call for a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Okay, Ms. Ban um, Ms. Belnick, do I have a second? Seconded by Mrs. Owens. Now, I am asking um, for Mr. Br Ms. Brown, sorry, <laughs> to read the Mathematics Awareness Month resolution. Thank you. Whereas the National Council of Teachers and Mathematics recognizes April as Mathematics and Statistics Awareness Month and whereas mathematical literacy is essential for all and the inclusion of such in mathematics education ensures a culture of equity where students are empowered by the opportunities math affords and whereas mathematics is an essential skill both in life and in the work workplace, whereas mathematical reasoning, sense-making, problem-solving, and communication are essential skills, and whereas the language and processes of mathematics are basic to all other disciplines, and whereas our expanding technology-based society depends, demands increased awareness and competence in mathematics, and whereas the school curricula and mathematics provide the foundation for meeting the above needs. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach designate April 2023 as Mathematics and Statistics Awareness Month in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens, and especially our young children and young adults, to continue mathematics studies and to understand how its application will relate to the occupations of the 21st century, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Two, the National Month of the Military Child. Ms. Anderson, would you please read that resolution? Thank you. This one is especially dear to my heart. Whereas approximately 13,000 students enrolled in Virginia Beach City Public Schools are military connected with the majority having at least one parent serving on active duty or in the reserve of the armed forces. And whereas military connected youth and their family have unique needs and face distinct challenges due to a high mobility, lengthy deployments of one or both parents and the stresses of loved ones serving in times of combat. And whereas the school division reaffirms its commitment to providing support, resources and enriching programs to enhance the educational experiences of military connected youth and whereas the Virginia Beach City Public School Board's Compass to 2025 strategic plan creates opportunities to actively engage military-connected parents and families in supporting student achievement and outcomes for success. And whereas April has been recognized by the Department of Defense since 1986 as the month of the military child. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes April as the month of the military child, and be it further resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach encourages all school staff to initiate, support, and participate in special activities to recognize the exceptional role and unique sacrifices our military-connected youth make in our nation's best interest, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 28th day of March, 2023. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Three, School Library Media Month and National Library Week. Mr. Callan, would you please read that resolution? Happy to do so. Whereas school libraries function as the information centers of the schools and provide for integrated, interdisciplinary, and school-wide learning activities, and whereas school libraries provide students with innovative learning opportunities that support their growth towards future readiness as inquirers, critical thinkers, problem solvers, collaborators, and communicators, whereas school libraries promote information literacy and the enjoyment of reading, viewing, and listening for young people of all ages and all levels of development, and whereas school libraries provide resources and learning activities that represent a diversity of experiences, opinions, and social and cultural perspectives, 
supporting the concept that intellectual freedom and access to information are prerequisites to effective and responsible citizenship in a democracy, and whereas the Virginia Beach City School Board recognizes the vital role that school libraries pray, play in the educational process, and whereas Virginia Beach Public Libraries and Virginia Beach School Libraries have formed a unique partnership that provides for the sharing of resources and services to the mutual benefit of all patrons. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Virginia Beach City School Board reconfirm its belief in the value of the school library program and officially recognize the month of April 2023 as School Library Media Month and the week of April 23 through 29, 2023 as National Library Week, calling their significance to the attention of all Virginia Beach citizens and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board. Thank you, Mr. Cowan. For Student Leadership Week, Mr. Culpepper, would you please read that resolution? Whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools sponsors uh, student leadership activities in order to provide students with vital experience in, in exercising a voice in matters of common concern, reconciling diverse interests, and selecting leaders. Whereas student leaders are a positive influence on their peers, modeling good character and scholarship in and out of the classroom, and serve as change agents to improve the overall climate and academic performance levels of their schools, their division, and their city. Whereas student leaders do not automatically develop sound leadership skills and require trained, dedicated mentors and advisors to help them develop the essential traits and characteristics of a leader and to provide the positive experiences necessary to expand their skills and foster their paths to becoming effective leaders. Whereas the support of school administrators and faculty, parents, and community members is necessary to help ensure the successful education of all emerging student leaders, whereas School Leadership Week serves as an ideal time to bring attention to the important and uh, integral contributions that student leaders and all students' activities make in our nation's schools. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes the last full week of March as Virginia Beach City Public Schools Student Leadership Week in support of National Student Leadership Week and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to seek opportunities to recognize student leaders in our schools and support their training and activities as they prepare themselves for their future stations as leaders of our city, state, and nation. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach on this 28th day of March, 2023. Thank you, Mr. Culpepper. Number five. The Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll. Ms. Owens, would you please read that resolution? Yes. Whereas public schools and local businesses are an integral part of this community, and whereas many local businesses play a crucial role in supporting our schools, and whereas the economic health of our community, state, and nation depends on a strong public school system, and whereas collaboration between local public schools and local businesses strengthens schools and the business community alike by providing a well-trained, highly educated workforce, and whereas an excellent public school system is vital to the quality of life in this community and fundamental to preserving a strong democratic society, now and in the future, now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach names Shorebreak Pizza, JPIX, and Rubin Communications Group to the 2023 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll, showing appreciation for their ongoing support of this community's public schools. Their work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools possible for every child who attends them. Thank you, Ms. Owens. I call for a vote to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. 15, action. Personnel report, 
administrative appointments. I call for a motion to approve the March 28, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. Ms. Owens, and do I have a second? Ms. Melnick. Any discussion? I call for a vote to approve the March 28, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. And Dr. Spence, do you have any administrative appointments? I do. I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I could just ask Kristen Johnson to please stand up. Ms. Johnson has served as a teacher in Virginia Beach since 2012 at Tallwood High School. Most recently has been serving as an administrative assistant at Lansdowne High School. And we're very pleased this evening that the school board has accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next coordinator of the Health Sciences Academy at Bayside High School. Congratulations. <laughs> I understand you have a few guests with you. Would you please introduce us? Yay. Thank you all for being here tonight. We Thank you. It. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Well, members, I have returned with one uh, policy for you on action. This is policy 529. It's awards for achievement, class rank, and honor designations. There are a number of changes here. I'm actually going to read them for you so you're clear about what's happening. On section D, which reads honor designations, the proposed new language would read, beginning in the 2023-24 school year, each high school will provide class point averages for class rank for individual colleges, universities, scholarships, or military applications that require this information or that is requested by a parent, legal guardian, or student. The principal designee shall also provide colleges and universities with explanation of Latin honor systems to the Virginia Beach City Public Schools transcript profile. If you go down further under D1, the recommendation is under D1 to add, D1 to add a section D, which will read to determine the, for, let me clarify that. Under section one is a student grade point average will compute for the following purposes. You will now add a section D is to determine class rank of individuals and a subsection E to determine the valedictorians and salutatorians for the graduating class. Going down further to section three, it would now be proposed to read, the designation of valedictorian and salutatorian will be utilized. A student enrolled in a Virginia Beach City Public Schools advanced academic program who transfers to a comprehensive school during their junior or senior year will not qualify for valedictorian or salutatorian. The superintendent designee may authorize exceptions to this subsection. A second paragraph would be added that would read, for the Princess Anne High School International Baccalaureate Program and the Ocean Lakes High School Math and Sciences Academy, the superintendent shall authorize a valedictorian Salutatorian for each advanced academic program and one for the comprehensive school. Those are the proposed recommendations to policy 529. Is there any discussion? Ms. Anderson. We don't have a point of order. We don't have a motion. No. Oh. So sorry, I'm sorry. Make a motion for this to be considered. Okay. Made a motion. Can, 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 can I, I clarify second? that to be considered or to be approved? I make a motion to for this um, to be approved. Okay, to be approved. A second. And do I have a second, Ms. Manning? So Ms. Anderson has made the motion to approve this policy change of 529, and Ms. Manning like has seconded. Okay. And now I have any discussion. Would you like to speak? I'd like to speak to the okay. motion. Ms. Anderson. First of all, I'd like to make a correction in case there are any constituents who are listening who I've um, um, responded to in the last couple weeks. I'd like to make a correction to several emails that I've recently responded to. And in my response to, to the constituents about the Latin honors designation, 
I wrote that the, dis that the distinctions would be printed on the student's diploma. However, I recently was informed that we do not print the distinctions on the diplomas, but we do include those honor distinctions in their, on their transcripts when they are sent out. We, I want to speak a little bit now to the reason behind all of this. We made the decision in 2018 to eliminate Val Sal after a lengthy set of discussions as well as research where we learned several other reasons to support the decision, including information that other school divisions in our state and country had given it up as well. The decision was not made lightly, but the biggest reason was the fact that some of our academies have weighted classes that only academy students are allowed to take. The zoned students, who are not academy students, but who attend the schools with academies that have weighted classes, could take AP and honors classes, they could make straight A's and still never come close to a grade point average of 5.0 or higher, which is what some of the GPA of the academy students can make. We had several students from those schools speak to us and write to the board about this issue. We put in place the Latin honor system to distinguish the differences of GPAs that our students had attained. And the designations of cum laude, magna cum laude, and summa cum laude are recognitions that the academic world recognizes as astute awards. Many of our constituents have sent emails in support of those awards as well. Here we are tonight, though, again to vote on the issue of Val Sal. And as a member of the policy committee, I've participated in lengthy discussions about the matter. During our last meeting, the board, the policy committee was told that there are only two academies that have weighted classes. So I suggested a compromise. My suggestion was that in the schools where academies have weighted classes, we have two valedictorians and two salutatorians, a cat, one for some for a set for the academy and one for the non-academy. And since there are only two academies that have weighted classes, that, that will only happen in two of our high schools. I offered this compromise for the policy committee to bring forward to the full board for discussion and vote. And knowing that we will still use the Latin honor system to show academic distinctions and those distinctions will be sent with student transcripts. With that inclusion, I'm very supportive of the new policy reinstating Val Sal into our graduations. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Ms. Franklin. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say that I appreciate all of the conversation and discussion that went on in 2018. I actually really like the Latin honor system, but I also agree with the fact that we um, already calculate GPA. Uh, I've done, uh, had a lot of conversations myself with the public, with our leadership team. And since we already um, calculate it and they're recognized at graduations, right now I think it is appropriate to you know, provide those titles because they, the kids do work very hard for those. Um, so I think it's a great compromise. I appreciate the board's work uh, or the PRC committee's work um, for the vigorous discussion um, that you've had this year as well. I do want to potentially, well, not potentially, I, I want to, propose an amendment to this to, or have open up to, to open up a discussion. Um, is there a possibility that we could put this into effect since we already calculate GPA um, and for the purpose of um, uh, announcing their name at graduation? Uh, Dr. Spence, is, would, would there be a, a problem trying to put this into effect for this year? I'm just asking for an honest opinion on that. You're asking me a question, so um, I want to make sure I'm not doing anything procedurally wrong since you started with your proposing an amendment, but the answer to the question is, I don't know. I'm going to have to go back to our uh, student support services team, and we're going to have to look at what it would take to um, to do that, although, again, I, as you noted, we, we already know what students' GPAs are and uh, calculate them anyway, so I think it could be done. I think the biggest concern that, that I know administration has expressed during that conversations around that has been you will have students who have made certain decisions about the courses that they're taking um, with an understanding that valedictorian and salutatorian were not part of the equation and if you put that into play this year you're going to get some concerns about well if I had known you were going to do this then I would have charted my course a little bit differently 
and that's come up um, from the principals as well as from our school counselors as a concern. So I would um, encourage the board not to do that. I think that was part of the conversation during the PRC okay. meeting. Well, thank you for clarifying. I just wanted to find out what, what the reasoning was behind that, so I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to hold off on my amendment then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Manning. Thank you. I, I would like to just kind of go back to our last meeting. We had a lot of conversation, a lot of input, where we went back to the PRC and really thoroughly considered that input. And uh, I just want to highlight the changes that we made from the last school board meeting. Um, we did, because initially I also wanted it to begin miss, um, this, this school year. Um, but based upon some feedback that we got, we did change it to beginning in 23-24. Um, the second change that we made, we got some feedback that we didn't want to change the GPA um, to 3.25, something I still, I still want to consider in the future, but in order to compromise, I, I got rid of that under 2A. It's going to remain 3.0 for honor graduate. Um, the third change that we made was in, um, I believe this was Ms. Owen's suggestion, I wanna thank her for that. Um, you know, cause the language under item number three, um, where you had to be eligible, to be eligible for Sal, you would have to complete the last four consecutive semesters enrolled in the high school. And um, it was pointed out that that could be harmful to our military students. So we did take that out and use some alternative language there that we thought um, could be am amenable for everyone. And then lastly, on item number four, um, we only included, rather than all of the academy programs, we only uh, um, considered the advanced academic programs, Ocean Lakes and um, Princess Anne IB for the two valedictorian salutatorians. And um, I, I hope that this will get wide support from the board. Um, when, when this was voted on f five years ago today, I believe I looked at the date, is when we voted to take away valedictorian salutatorian. And at the time, 77% of the public said that they supported keeping, um, uh, or 74%, I believe it was, supported keeping Valsal in addition to the Latin honor system. And so I, th I, I hope, and, and as indicated by the number of emails that we received that overwhelmingly support this, um, I think that if we did a survey again, we would get similar results, if not higher numbers for that. Um, and um, so I, I just wanna encourage the board, you know, we, we really compromised on this to try to bring broad consensus. So I would just like to ask for your support for this policy. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call on Dr. Spence. He'd like to speak to um, several things Ms. Manning said. Yeah, it really, it's just one thing. Um, so the <clears throat> just a reminder for the board that during that initial conversation, this is regarding item, um, item, sorry, let me get my section right, D4. Um, there were, we heard from the students from the advanced academic programs and, and their non-program uh, peers for sure. We also heard from some academy students. So for example, we heard from Salem High School students who have a prescribed course of study that does not have honors waiting. And they were concerned in that conversation that in the academy, if they choose to be in the academy, then they can't become valedictorian of the school because they, they don't have enough weighted courses in a prescribed course of study. Oh, I thought I was. Um, and so, no, so there are two advanced academic programs. It's, it's the reverse for some of our academies. Because of their prescribed course of study, they can't actually take the weighted courses that their non-program peers can take. So um, I bring it up only to say, I don't want to muddy the water here. I recognize people make choices, and that's part of life. Um, certainly, um, um, but I, I just think there may be some questions about, well, if the philosophy is that you should have two at those schools, then should you account for that in some of your other programs where being in an academy might inhibit your um, ability to be a valedictorian because of the course of study. I also think you may hear from some of our center students, and I know the GSA students have asked for years for their courses to be weighted as well, and one of the reasons behind that request is certainly the rigor of the program at the GSA, but also um, I think because it does limit their ability to pursue being valedictorian or salutatorian. So. Um, just want to point that out because I know that was part of that conversation. Did you all hear him? Okay. 
well, I have some people over there just, they're like this, Dr. Spence, so I'm sorry, but they want to hear that. And I know Ms. Franklin is one that was not hearing this. So hold on, Ms. Anderson, please. Dr. Spence is not finished. I'm asking him to, to state it maybe quickly. Okay, let me just reiterate. Sorry, I will project. That's okay, I'm a little froggy tonight. Um, Again, and, it, it, and it's really, I think, just the board figuring out its philosophy on this, but if we're saying we're going to authorize a valedictorian and salutatorian for each academic, advanced academic program, what we're talking about is PA in Ocean Lakes, and then one for the comprehensive students in that building who are not in the IB program or the Math Science Center, you may hear some concerns from students who are in our other academy programs because, for example, students who spoke to us back in 2018 uh, from Salem High School mentioned that they take a prescribed series of courses that do not have honors waiting and therefore cannot become valedictorian or salutatorian in their building if they're academy students. And so it's always non-academy students who can become valedictorian or salutatorian. And you may also hear from some of our center students who experience the same thing because they choose to go to the Advanced Technology Center or the Technology Education Center. Those are non-weighted courses and therefore they're eliminating their opportunity to be valedictorian or salutatorian by making those choices. And you may also hear from the uh, Governor's School for the Arts, they're making a similar choice. So uh, not that that needs to influence your decision, but I wanna at least make, put it on the table because you're making an exception for two programs and I think you may hear from folks who um, attend other programs to wonder why you would not take a similar approach or try to figure out how to ad address um, their concerns. So it's just that one area for me that I just wanted to remind the board of that conversation. Okay, um, Ms. Martin. Thank you. Um, so I'm not opposed to Valsal at all, as long as we're continuing the Latin honors. Um, I did a deep dive into scholarships and academic common market, and many scholarship-making organizations still look at Val and Sal, and we want to make sure that our students are able to access every dollar they can. But I did have two questions. Um, and number three here, does that mean that students can transfer between comprehensive schools in our district at any time and still compete for Val and Sal? at their new school. So for instance, if I was attending Hipsville High School, my family needed to move, and then I'm going to Ocean Lakes High School. Um, am I still able to become Val Sal at Ocean Lakes? Is that correct? I don't think that's how that reads. Okay, so you cannot I, transfer between is, high schools in the district. That's how I read it too, though. I, okay, hold on. Wait, and I did have a, a second question. In the research that I did in other military communities um, with Val and Sal, we don't have anything in here that decides tiebreaker on GPA. We don't have anything in here that decides how many co-valedictorians and co-salutatorians you're going to have. There is one school district uh, outside of San Diego that had 22 co-valedictorians. So there's nothing in this policy that says to what decimal point is the tiebreaker. Um, so that we need to figure out what that would look like when there might be multiple people with the same GPA. So can we transfer within the school district to different high schools? We know that sometimes uh, students have to move, custody issues, death of a parent, and then how will we figure out tiebreakers? Okay, um, I'm gonna have Dr. Spence speak to that, please. So <clears throat> the answer is yes, um, students can transfer from one per, uh, school to another. There are limited circumstances for that. Generally speaking, what happens is a student's in the IB program decides that's not for them anymore and they want to go back to their home school. And so they'll go back and just be a comprehensive school student at their home school. I think this, this part of the policy was intended to address that because they will have had a leg up on the comprehensive students in that building given the weighted courses they will have taken in ninth and 10th grade that may not have been available in their, in their home school. Um, the other question you were asking, um, about um, how we do that. So it is the case that we have had that. We, uh, I'll have to go back and get you specific information, but we generally go out to, I think, about four decimal places on the GPA. And so um, past that, I don't think we go further than that. And I, the, when I say I have to get to you the answer, I need to know if that's by state code um, or not. And so I'll, I'll look into that and get you the answer. Uh, but we have had co-valedictorians um, in the past in Virginia Beach, and certainly, I mean, as many as could could earn that distinction. If they're tied out at four decimal places, then we would we would recognize that if that's if that recognition exists. 
So I'm still a little confused on students who are in a comprehensive school and transfer to another comprehensive school, say senior year. No fault of their own, they had a change in circumstances. Can they compete for Valsal in their new school? Yeah, this, this appears to address only students who are in one of our advanced academic programs. We only have two advanced academic programs. That's the IB Academy at Princess Anne High School, and that's the Math Science Center at Ocean Lakes High School. So this is specifically saying if you're in one of those two programs and you transfer to a comprehensive school, so in other words, perhaps go back to your home school during junior or senior year, you don't qualify, but there is an exception built in if there's a particular reason to consider it. Okay, well, I'm comfortable with this then. It addresses my concerns with military families, people moving in and out um, in the, within the city. So thank you. Ms. Manning, I, I'm going to, you kept raising your hand when she was asked us, would you like to say something to that? Well, I'll, I'll wait my turn. Dr. Spence mostly answered. Okay. I was just wanting to answer her question, but I'll do it when it's my turn. Okay. I just, All right. I just wanted to. So wait a minute, Ms. Martin. Okay. We have, there's a whole list of people. <laughs> so, I, I specifically Ms. Wanted, specifically wanted to address something. Well, Mr. Culpepper's next. next. So. I'll be quick. Uh, I just want to address something the superintendent brought up. Uh, Don't be too quick. You can <laughs> slow it down. We'll be fine. <laughs> I'll be brief and speak slowly. Uh, again, not to muddy the waters, uh, as the superintendent said, but uh, I think that's a discussion for later. You know, I, we talked about this being a compromise of several positions, and I think it's something we can all support, which is good. Uh, you brought up whether honors uh, should get credit. And the other one, I think you were implying, but you, you, you mentioned a program, was whether or not dual enrollment uh, classes should get extra credit. And I think that's something we should discuss at a later time that, that will relate to this, of course. Uh, but not for discussion for now. I just want to point out that I think that does wrap into this whole thing, though. Thank you. Um, Ms. Owens. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a as a question and a comment. Um, with the ranking portion of this, uh, how do the early grads fit into the ranking? We heard today that we had 200 and some odd uh, students graduate this January and we're expecting those numbers to rise with our four by four and flexible um, uh, scheduling. And I'm wondering, do they get a class rank if you graduate in January? Are you ranked within that year that you were supposed to graduate? Does that still stay within the number of total for the end? And how, how do you calculate that if you actually graduated at a different time? Yeah, they're, um, they're going to be calculated as a member of their class. So if they gra even though if they graduate in December, they're still con – so if they were to graduate in December of just past, they would still be considered a member of the class of 2023 and they would be ranked in that class. So they would leave with whatever rank they had at that time based on the amount of students in their class at that time? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then I guess my other statement or concern uh, does have to do with the nuances of the other academies uh, that making a choice to be in the environmental sciences program or in the uh, performing arts academy means that you have to take the courses that are required for the academy, therefore don't have the space to take AP courses. And I agree that that is a choice that students make as they're coming in, considering the whole picture. Uh, Ms. Manning pointed out that the original vote on this was happened five years ago today. So prior to, to me being on the board, prior to the majority of the board sitting here. Um, and it took four years to implement so that when the decision was made, students coming into the program could go in with an informed consent about those decisions in the programs of study that they were doing. And so it concerns me for us to make a decision midway into people's decision, you know, into their process where they didn't have the opportunity to understand the consequences of their decision, that I was going to go into this program and be well-rounded and, and end up with a 3.8 or a 4.0, whatever I could get, but having an understanding that this will rule me out from the possibility of that accomplishment 
And we had told them it wasn't on the table. And so to pop it up without allowing the informed consent that happened when it came off the table is a concern to me. I appreciate the uh, compromises and uh, changes that came from the discussion. My only sticking point here is if that starting point would be whatever it is, four years out, so that the people making the choice can do it with a fresh start, coming in that year and make the decisions based on their academics for whatever their goal is. If they, if they have the goal for that, that they can do it and make those decisions. So that, that's my concern with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Ms. Melnick. So I'm not opposed to voting yes, but I, I do want to make one thing very clear to the new board members and to anyone listening that I, I was there th through this whole decision-making process, and I will tell you it was the conversations were lengthy. Some of them were painful. Um, as one, as somebody stated tonight, um, the tradition of Val and Sal is 251 years old. Um, but as you can see, just from this very brief conversation, th this was not a black and white issue. There was a lot of gray matter. And you've heard it tonight. You heard it from Dr. Spence. And I said this once before, we created this inequity. Not an equity like we're far left people, woke culture, um, we want to give everybody a trophy. It was not that at all. This was a very difficult conversation that we had for a very, very long time, and then it took us four years to implement it. And so while we will, we will vote on this and land somewhere tonight, we also need to be prepared that there are people who cannot work harder to become number one in their class because it is impossible for them. And I want people to remember that. And we heard that a lot this, this evening. Oh, it's, this is good. It makes people work hard. It makes people try harder. It doesn't matter in some of these cases how hard you work or how many extra classes you take, it is mathematically impossible for you to be number one. I will say, though, the best part about this is not being able to transfer after two years in, in the IB or Math and Science Academy, because there, there were instances where students were able to create a GPA that far outweighed anything anyone was, be, was able to achieve in their own high school. And that's part of the gaming of the system that occurred. And this board needs to know, anyone who wasn't sitting here, that we did hear from, from teachers and from principals who said it, it becomes a pretty rotten game that kids play. That's going to happen. It's going to happen as they leave school and enter the workforce. People are going to play dirty games to try to game the system to, to get whatever. Um, and that's fine. But please be mindful and please be ready to explain to the public that while we want to honor our number one and our number twos, that it's impossible for some students to achieve that. And please use the word impossible. Um, and that's all I ask, um, is, that, is that you share this properly. Because in theory, it's perfect. But in reality, not so much. Thank you, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Anderson. So, um, Dr. Spence, um, when we sat in the policy committee meeting, um, we were told that there were only two high schools that had weighted classes. But 
you're telling me that there are weighted classes about Salem or um, so so clarity you, yeah, please there are there are only two so if you think about our academy programs most people lump them all together but there are actually two types of programs. We have our academies and we have advanced academic programs. Mm -hmm. The advanced academic programs are the IB program at PA High School and the Math Science Center at Ocean Lakes High School. Okay. Those are the only two programs that have weighted credit for their courses. The other academy programs do not have weighted credit for their courses. So, um, now, that all high schools have other courses with weighted credit. Right. All high schools offer advanced placement. And, and advanced placement has weighted credit, um, and so you can get um, you can get some weighted credit. But the the point would be if all of your classes that you're taking have weighted credit at an advanced academic program, if you're not in that program, there is no conceivable way that you, it, assuming you know, side by side, you take all of the most rigorous classes that are available to you outside of that program and you're getting straight A's and the person in the academy is getting straight A's, you'll never be a valedictorian. It'll always be the person in the, acad in the advanced academic program. Mm -hmm. the, what I was saying to you earlier is that the opposite also plays out in some of our academies. Okay. Because in an academy, you have a prescribed series of academy courses that you must take as a member of the academy. And because those courses are not weighted, often you are not able to pursue some of the AP classes that your peers in the non-academy part of the school may be able to pursue. And so they may be able to get weighted credit that you're not able to get and very often are going to be valedictorian above before academy students are going to be valedictorian or salutatorian because of that. So it has the exact opposite effect that the advanced academy programs. And that's, again, what we heard um, specifically at that time we heard from students at Salem High School who had that concern uh, because they have a very structured schedule with the performing arts uh, and the visual arts. So I hope that helps. That helps. Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and, and the reason we put these two categories in here under three um, was specifically because of the um, the program at Princess Anne and Ocean Lakes um, having those particular classes. And we did have a, some students who, who left those advanced academic programs and went back to their comprehensive school where there was no weighted classes at, at that level. And, um, and that happened where that, that um, and one particular one I'm thinking about, that student went back and became the valedictorian at the high school because there was no chance anyone else could have ever attained uh, the grade point average that that person had. So that's why we put that in there, and especially for number four. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm still in support of this, but my suggestion would be, and it, just a suggestion for administration to possibly maybe take a look at the weighted classes. I'm asking administration to please do that and rethink some of the weighted classes that are out there for, um, for students. It's about e like, for example, in the Governor's School and the Career and Technical Center, that type of play, those type of schools. So, thank you. Ms. Manning. Thank you. So, to address a couple of the questions um, or comments that have been made, because we did have some of these same conversations in PRC, um, transferring to school, to, out of the comprehensive school, uh, I'm sorry, the advanced academic program to a comprehensive school, it's been talked about that kids game the system. But there are times, could be times, where a student has no control over leaving their program. And so we did have that stipulation in there that the superintendent may authorize exceptions. Um, if there are some exceptions to that, we wanted you know, there to be some latitude, so that's why we put that in there. And um, I agree um, regarding the weighting. Um, you know, our grading practices have even changed, but our weighting hasn't. So I, I do think that we should um, look at the weighting policy as a separate policy. And I do think that that's something that we should look at with the governor's school, with um, the ATC, with some of our other programs, and analyze our should we make some changes there? So that's something that I'm happy to bring forward to, to the Policy Review Committee, and if colleagues on the board have um, input on what you'd like to see, I'd be happy to work with administration to 
kind of review um, what classes are weighted right now and to see if we need to make any changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manning. Ms. Weems. Sorry, Ms. Franklin. She moved you first. Sorry. Well, I personally feel like the way that it's worded for tonight, I think that I can support the policy the way it, is, it sits. Um, because, you know, someone made a, a comment about that, you know, for some kids, academia is their sport. And I actually agree with that, that for some, that this is a very important um, honor and it's, it's, it's something that they put their focus on. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's important to recognize that. Um, and on the, on the flip side, though, the, they do have, I would assume that if somebody chose, because nothing has changed since the academy was put in place, but I assume that if somebody chose the Arts Academy, for example, I don't know that their goal is to be Valsal. I think that their, their goal might be to attend the academy. I, I mean, you, you all might disagree with me there, but I think for them, attending this amazing academy where they were, their interest and their focus is recognized and enhanced and, um, and they are learning things that they're very much interested in. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure that, it, that it, it, it actually flips. And again, I'm not, I haven't been part of the discussion since 2018, I get that. But I'm just trying to say that I personally feel like the way that it says tonight is, is something that I could probably vote for that I can vote for, I'm just gonna say that. So, so I'm, I'm open to other discussions, but I just feel like that somebody doesn't choose the Arts and Academy or ATC. Um, they, they choose that going in knowing what their interest is and what the goal of attending that academy looks like. So that's, and again, I'm happy to listen to other comments, but um, that's kind of what my thoughts are right now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weems. Yes, and I was around when we um, voted in 2018. I think I was one of three who did not support it. It was kind of mind-boggling to me, but that's okay. And then I was around when we revisited in 2021. So, um, of course, I am going to support it. I've been very supportive of this for years and years and years. But I do want to say that the compromise that the committee, PRC committee, the compromises that the um, committee made, I really do appreciate it. Um, some of the compromises were more than I would want to give, but we've got 11 people up here with 11 different ideas, so I appreciate the effort, so I will be able to support it. Um, also, I just wanna let my colleagues know, we've got 5,000 graduates a year. We, we're not gonna please everybody. We cannot please everybody. And so I think it's very appropriate that the two academic academies are set aside. We'll look at the other stuff, but the compromises that were made, um, I, I think it's very appropriate knowing that we are gonna get concerns from some, we are gonna get questions, we are gonna get disappointments, but I think for the majority of those 5,000 seniors, this is the right thing to do, and it's the most fair thing that we can do. So I um, would be thrilled if we could all stand behind this policy and get balance out back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Ms. Owens. I just uh, wanted to add, because I forgot to mention it the first time, um, that one of the things that has struck me uh, this school year is the amount of involvement we've had from students. Students showing up and advocating for what they want, for what they believe is right. We've had over 120 student speakers this school year. Not one of them has come asking for Val Sal back. I've heard from a lot of parents, heard from multiple parents today who said they had seniors. Didn't hear from the seniors, but we heard from their parents and, and I have to, to weigh that. Um, I think that this, uh, policy as brought back is better than what it was the first time, and it's better than perhaps what we've had in the past. Um, I, I would like to see the adjustments for the uh, other programs that we have for the governor's school, for the ATC, um, for, for our programs in general, having a look at that to have it be a, 
a fair shake. And while I can't, well, I'm, I am going to vote no on this tonight. Um, my feelings aren't going to be hurt if it passes. I want to make sure that my vote allows for students to have that informed decision going in and not putting the finish line in as they are coming into their junior year. I don't know that it would make a difference, like Ms. Franklin said, maybe they would still choose that, but it's not my choice. And the students have voices that they have been exercising. And this hasn't been something that they've asked to have that, that final post changed in their junior year. Um, and so I, I would vote yes if it said it was going to start four years from now. I would vote yes on it, it would be enough compromise. My no vote is going to be because I want people to go into their academic careers having the, the landscape and the, the map to choose their actual path. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Ms. Brown. Okay, so I think a lot of these, um, I think they were more like collaboration. I think that they were really easy decisions to make. I think that the work that we did on this policy in the policy review committee, I'm pretty proud of it. Um, I've heard a lot of people say in email, and this is more for the constituents than my colleagues on the board, that um, the universities are paying, maybe not a lot, but a few, um, less and less attention. And the thing that really strikes me is, is the more prestigious the university, the more they look at that competitive edge. The only thing that's disappointing to me in this policy is that we cannot do it sooner, and I agree it wouldn't really be fair to do it this year. Happy to keep Latin honors. A lot of people have thought that there is, or we got a few emails with people thinking that we're getting rid of Latin honors. There's no changes to Latin honors, so I just wanted to make sure that we clarified that. I did talk to some former students. Um, a lot of you know that I coach figure skating for a living, so I have access to some of our seniors and some of our class that graduated last year. Um, and I actually have a skater that attended the Ocean Lakes Math and Science Academy and is in college now. And um, the seniors were disappointed that this recognition was gone last year. And while there was some recognition, recognition from the peers that they might not be able to qualify for Valsal, they also didn't want to take the classes that are a little more rigorous to get those um, GPA boosts. So, but again, I am happy with the language that we've added. Um, you know, and we do, another thing that we do is we do athletic signings for students when they get onto an athletic team for college. We have a ceremony just for them to recognize them, and I think it's great. I think we need to recognize all of our students for their individual achievements, including academics, so I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Callan. I've heard tonight that it won't be perfect. I've heard tonight that it's going to be better. So I would say very succinctly, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is pretty good. Does it reach perfection? No, and it never will. Will it provide us opportunities in the future to adjust, tweak, and amend where we say, you know, in retrospect, since we didn't see everything, let's do it a little bit differently and we can tweak it going forward. And I hope my comments are not seen as inappropriate, but let's not beat a horse to death. It's not perfect, but it's good. So I would say let's go forward with good and try to make it better as time and experience shows us where we can do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Callum. Ms. Melnick. Um, Dr. Spence, well, as, as you all know, um, I proudly serve on the governor's 
the Governor's School for the Arts Regional Board. Um, it, it's a true highlight for me. And um, I also had a daughter that attended the Governor's School years ago. Um, but Dr. Spence, we've, I've been advocating for at least the look, you know, looking at the weighted opportunity for some of these classes for years. And I know it's a, it's a pretty intense look from the division and um, it, I'm not sure if maybe we can add a workshop or something, maybe just as a general explanation for how that type of um, opportunity, um, well, you know what I'm saying. Um, I know we, we, you just gave us our quarterly forecast. I know it's pretty meaty, but maybe, or maybe add it for the summer for the retreat how that would happen? Yes, I, let's, we should have a three-day retreat. <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, listen. Yeah, the way we keep adding, we might have to, y'all. Mr. We'll, uh, Mr. Uh, Delaney agree. has moved beyond, behind that TV because no. I, I have cornered him in the hallway. Yeah, he's times. hiding, I don't blame him. I've been talking, I've been talking about this for years. No, I, think, so. um, I think we, we need to have this discussion and we'll, I'll sit down with the team and we'll figure out where we think we can we can fit it in and come back to board leadership and, and ask about that. Um, and I'll just mention, this is guided by code. There is actually state code on how you can weight right. courses. So we'll, we'll need to pay attention to that and talk about it. Thank you. Okay. All, all finished with our discussion. Okay. So um, there's been a motion and a second and a discussion. Now, I call for a vote to approve the policy 529 awards for achievement slash class rank slash honor designations. All in favor, please raise your hands. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. Okay, all against, please raise your hands. And we have one nay, so the motion did pass with 10 ayes and one nay. Thank you, guys. It was a great discussion, and I think it was needed. I think we needed to have that opportunity for everybody to, to voice what they needed to, to say. Now, we are going to see the added um, uh, portion of this agenda that we added during the workshop. The appointment to the Ad Hoc Workforce Committee is Ms. Stacy Martin. So, I need a motion for this, okay? Ms. Weems, and do I have a second? Second, Ms. Franklin. Okay, is there any discussion? Ms. Melnick. Did you happen to appoint an alternate? No, and let me tell you why. When we discussed it in that um, meeting, in the, um, the meeting that we had, uh, that Mrs. Uh, Weems was talking about at workshop with the uh, city council members, we talked about an alternate, and they felt that it was, it was okay just to have two members and not an alternate. Two members for city council, two members for school board. So we said okay. And that's why we decided not to bring forth the alternate. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more? Ms. Ms. Anderson. So if one of the of our members can't make one of the meetings, how are we supposed to handle that? Are we just going to go by what the, our bylaws state that the chair can appoint someone? Yeah, as usual, if you can't make a meeting to an appointed um, committee that you're on, please let me know. Please let the chair know and vice chair. And I will appoint someone to take that, that place, whether it be Ms. Weems or Ms. Martin or any of our other committees. Just let me know, and I'll appoint someone to go in place for that person. Okay? Is that good? All right. Well, that's what the bylaws state. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, any more discussion? Okay. So, I call for a vote. Um, for the appointment to the Ad Hoc Workforce Committee is Ms. Stacy Martin and Ms. Carolyn Weems. All in favor, please raise your hand. 
Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now we have committee organization or board reports. Remember, uh, if you have anything to report, as a reminder, this is the time for short reports, and school board members may file full reports with the clerk to be distributed to other school board members if yours is much longer. Okay, so if you have one, I know Ms. Manning does, Ms. Franklin, I have one. Anybody else? Oh, Ms. Weems. Okay, so we'll start with Ms. Manning. So the Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities had their awards ceremony, um, I think it was two weeks ago now, and each year uh, the committee um, nominates or gives awards to people who, in our community, who've gone above and beyond for people with special needs in our community. Um, one of my, my committee members here, uh, down in the audience, and uh, Actually, one of our constituents that attends a lot of our school board meetings nominated one of our school employees to receive an award, Mr. Brian Malsh. And he, I don't know exactly what his title is, but he helps place um, students with special needs in our community into jobs in, in the community. And um, he, he just does a fantastic job with that. So we recognized him. He wasn't able to attend the meeting, but we did recognize him with an award, as well as TJ Max at Red Mill Commons, who employs a lot of our students. And so they also received award for their work. And we still have, I was told, we still have some of our students who graduate and stay on there and just love working there at the TJ Max. So thank you. Thank you, that's a great report. Ms. Franklin. Uh, we have gifted CAC on Monday, just wanted to let that, uh, the public know. But um, I am very, very excited to announce that we also have pitch night at the EBA Academy at Kempsville High School. And that is May 10th, 2023. The, it is open to the public, and I know for one that I'm going to put it on my calendar. Uh, free tickets can be reserved using the QR code. I am going to make sure that um, our, our clerk has this so people can uh, get the, those free tickets. But this is such an exciting event for the EBA. Um, last year, we had Governor Yunkin be one of the judges, and, um, and it, was, it was just a, a great event. And uh, one of the things that I'm really excited excited about is the fact that we have the CBA Academy at Kempsville High School because we have some graduates from Kempsville here and uh, as you know it's it, it's a great high school and we definitely uh, needed to um, make sure that we had an academy there so it, it could thrive and, and continue uh, on with its good work. So it is May 10th 2023 doors open at 4 p.m. and the event begins at 5 p.m. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Um, what is your name? Ms. Franklin, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Melnick. <laughs> sorry about that, Bill. Um, Dr. Spence and I have the Governor's School for the Arts Regional Board meeting tomorrow morning. And just a reminder to my colleagues, if you are interested in anything that happens at the Governor's Schools in any of our six disciplines, which is musical theater, theater and film, uh, visual arts, vocal music, instrumental music, and dance. Um, I would be happy to get you tickets to any of our events, um, and and it's it's just magnificent. You will be shocked. In addition, um, our musical theater students work directly with um, Virginia Musical Theater and their performances uh, four times a year at the Sandler Center. Um, and those children have the opportunity to work with equity actors um, out of New York. So it's, it's really amazing. Um, but if you're ever interested, I'll make sure you're forwarded the emails from GSA, and um, I'd be happy to get you tickets to anything you'd like to see. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Melnick. Ms. Weems? Um, yes. Um, so last week, of course, I've already mentioned the Workforce Development Committee, and then also I attended um, the Special Education Advisory um, Committee. So if you want to um, discuss anything with SEAC, please give me a call. I also um, attended the subcommittee of the Mental Health Task Force, and we really keyed in on um, how to make, um, how to help um, ensure that all of our students um, 
feel like they belong to their school community, and of course, that has a lot to do with establishing um, a good, good rapport with at least one trusted adult in that building. So um, we're reaching out to get um, some surveys from the different schools about what they do in this area and you know best practices and how we can make sure that's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And um, the sister cities had their youth ambassador gala Friday night, and we had three contestants. And so we had a first, second, and third place with those three, which is great. They all got, they all performed beautifully. And we have a male as for the first time as our youth ambassador. He is a ninth grader at Tallwood High School, and his name is Dorian. I can't think of his last name. Miss um, Anderson, do you know his last name? Okay, but we're going to, if um, we are allowed to, I would like to introduce him to our school board um, in the next one or two meetings, so if that's possible. So he's our 2023 Youth Ambassador for Sister Cities. The second one, uh, that second um, committee that I want to report on is the they call it the GAC. It's the General Advisory Council for Technical and Career Education. Uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Weems could not attend, so I was there, and it was on uh, March the 22nd. Um, the one of our the president of the GAC, and she's been the president for I think five years right now, is Amy Mallinson. And Amy has, if anybody's been around for a while, you probably know her. She worked uh, with the Virginia Beach uh, Federal Credit Union for years, and she's with Langley, and now she's with Beach Credit Union. So she's um, a financial person. She's also been named as one of our, um, what do we call them, for the Workforce Development Committee. She's, she's the uh, representative for the Financial District as well as the um, General Advisory Council for the Tech Ad. Um, and it's just amazing to attend that meeting because there's just so many huge players in that room that represent uh, a large area of the workforces in our, in our city. Um, and they do a lot of work. Uh, Dr. Sarah Lockett, uh, obviously, is um, on that committee as well. Um, she also, uh, we had, um, there were students that presented from the ATC engineering student presentations. Um, and these students, won like first place in, I think it was a national competition. So just super students. Um, again, that's something we talk about, I guess, with Votech and all that, uh, those students, because they're, they're very, very bright and they work very hard. Um, and what Dr. Uh, Lockett said, and if you um, got a chance to look a little bit more on our, um, our quarterly uh, forecast for the last quarter, uh, you will see that the Perkins um, plan and budget will be presented for 23-24. She'll be sharing that with us during one of our weeks. So anyway, I just wanted to report on that. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the Green Run Performing Arts Department is going to be having three performances of Annie. Um, tickets for students are $8, adults are $10. It's going to be on March 30th, 31st, and April 1st. The show will begin at 7, doors open at 6. Um, tickets can be purchased on GoFan.co. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Spitz. Yeah, just a quick, um, so I won't be at the CSEP or the GSA regional board meetings tomorrow because we have official for a day. And so if our board members don't know what official for a day is, that's organized by our Office of Student Leadership. We collaborate with city leadership, and our students have the opportunity to sit and learn from city leaders and school division leaders across every one of our departments and every one of their departments. Um, it's a great opportunity. Everybody from the chiefs of each department that here and then the chiefs of each department at the city level, city manager, myself, everybody, uh, works with these students. It's been going on for years and years and years, and it's a terrific event, and um, we're really proud of that and of the opportunity that our kids have to interact with leadership and develop their own leadership skills. So I'm so glad you said that. I forgot all about it, and it's, it is an excellent event to attend. You will be 
really uh, fascinated and excited about it if you get to come. Um, one last thing, um, Pearls of Wisdom, again, is this Saturday. If you didn't get a ticket and you would like to, to go, it's Saturday. It starts at 12. I think it's 12 to 4. It's lots of fun, and it's on 44th, 24th Street okay. by the Virginia Beach Education Foundation. Great cause. Okay, so um, we are going to return to... Um, we don't have an informal workshop that's finished, our closed session. So I'm going to ask our vice chair, Ms. Weems, to read into closed session, um, and she'll do this on the dais, and then I'll ask for a motion a second, we'll call for a vote, and then we'll transition to the Einstein lab. Okay? <coughs> I move that the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exceptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711, Part A, paragraph 1, 2, 7, and 8 as amended to deliberate on the following matters. One, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, and evaluation or performance of departments or schools of public institutions of higher education where such evaluation will necessarily involve discussion of the performance of specific individuals. Two, discussion or consideration of admission or disciplinary matters or any other matters that would involve the disclosure of information contained in a scholastic record concerning any student of any public institution or higher education of the Commonwealth or any state school system. However, any such student, legal counsel, and if the student is a minor, the student's parent or legal guardian shall be permitted to be present during the taking of the testimony or presentation of evidence at a closed meeting. If such student, parents, or guardian so request in writing, and such request is submitted to the presiding officer of the appropriate board. Seven, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation or litigation posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable bias basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Eight, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter, namely to discuss A, student discrimination complaint appeal decision, B, student discrimination complaint regarding student discipline hearing, C, status of alleged Title IX complaint investigation, and D, consultation with legal counsel regarding participation in a procurement matter, probable litigation, and pending litigation matters. Second. Okay, so that was a motion and seconded by Ms. Melnick. All in favor, raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass to go into closed. Okay, we will move to the Einstein Lab. I'll give you about five or six minutes. Whereas the, <clears throat> whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in this closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. I need a motion on that. 
Moved by Ms. Anderson, Anderson seconded by Ms. Owens. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion passed. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read um, the resolution, okay? The resolution for the student discrimination appeal, um, the initials are AH. Whereas student AH, a high school student, filed a disability discrimination complaint against the staff members at the high school. And whereas the high school administration investigated the discrimination complaints and determined that they were unfounded. And whereas student AH appealed that determination and the school board appointed a hearing officer to conduct an appeal hearing and render findings of fact and recommendation to the school board. And whereas the hearing officer rendered findings of fact and recommendation on March 9th, 2023, and whereas on March 28th, 2023, the school board considered the hearing officer's findings of fact and recommendations, as well as the evidence submitted by student AH and the school administration. Now, therefore, it is resolved by the school board that one, the school board adopts the finding of fact and recommendation of the hearing officer, and two, the Department of School Leadership is directed to assess the volleyball coach at the school. Further resolved that the clerk shall provide a copy of this resolution to, to student AH, the student's attorney, school board attorney, the chief schools officer, and chief human resources officer, adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 28th day of March, 2023. Do I have a second? second. Oh. Ms. Franklin. Okay. Motion made by Ms. Riggs, seconded by Ms. Franklin. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion passed. Thank you. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>